hello everyone. This is criminal profiler Pat Brown and we're at the call-in day. So we're here with Lila today. Lila, are you there? I just want to make sure. I'm here. Oh, hello. there's Lila. Okay, I, I'm going to check out the. I'm going to check out our our room, <laughs> our chat room. Hi, Lisa. Lisa Ann is here, and Lisa S is here, and Molly is here. And let's see. Okay, wait a minute. Molly, Lisa has a quick question. Uh, oh. Okay, that's interesting. Lisa had an interesting question. Just saw Pat. Quick question: Can you set up a post where Pat Patreon members can share each other's email addresses to communicate with each other? I could do that. I'll set up a post and say, uh, "Yeah, if you want to put your if you want to put your um, your information here, you might do so." You know, or you know, so I can do that. I, I definitely can do that. You just have to be know that if I put it on a post, you know, people can see it. <laughs> so you know, if you don't want other people contacting you you know that could be problematic but uh, I will put up a post and then you could do that and that would be that would be fine can everybody hear both of us oh good can see and hear you Pat very clearly great because this is last time was a little bit better on the sound quality I, I took a photograph of the machine next to me so I wouldn't screw it up the next time I came back but I still hear like little hummy stuff and it's very annoying <laughs> So, at any rate, okay, Lisa. Oh, that's very nice, Lisa. Lisa says, hi, everyone. I love listening to these call-ins. Oh, that's awesome. You know, these are really fun because they're not scripted. <laughs> There's no plans particularly. And I get to know you guys and just have fun getting to know you and getting to hear your ideas. And so it's really cool. So anyway, Lila, um, do you want to any, tell any, the people anything about yourself or do you want to stay like anonymous oh no that's all right i live in um i live in fairfield iowa i moved here in 1993 from new york city where i started a business oh wow and i run my business out of fairfield iowa and um and there we go okay i have a question then you moved from the city to the not so city like area <laughs> i did i did well you see i'm uh, in addition to running a, a business it's a mail order business which they weren't that frequent back in 1993, although they are now. Oh, that's and true. Um, I happen to practice transcendental meditation, and I'm a teacher of TM. And, and I live in a town of about 9,500 people. Wow. And of those 9,500 people, about 3,000 of us practice transcendental meditation. Oh. <laughs> and there are two huge golden domes where we go and meditate for world peace twice a day. Oh, people goodness. may have heard of Fairfield, Iowa. It's the kind of like the capital city of transcendental meditation so okay. i moved here um yeah. to be a part of the community and there's so many people i've met in courses since 1972 i can't walk down the street without seeing someone i've known <laughs> since 1972 wow. so that's a little different from new york city isn't it that's uh, pardon one more time that's a little different from new york city yes it is yeah it is that sounds absolutely, absolutely lovely yeah. oh you do hear that that darn hum what the heck? You hear the slight hum. What? I don't know how to get rid of the hum. This is, I, I can't figure it out. I, I, you know, I keep, I keep playing around with the little whatevers and I hear the hum too and I'm not sure what causes it. So, is it my, hold on, hold on a second. I'm going to try something and you can tell me whether it's, it's better or worse. Okay. Is it less or is it the same? I was trying to turn down my microphone. And can you still hear me because I turned down my microphone? I think that's my microphone. Yeah, it is. How's that? Is it better? And can you hear me? Nobody can hear me anymore. So, no, so nobody's answering. <laughs> so anybody say it's any better? Or could be your equipment too close to each other? Yes, less. The equipment is too close. Well, you know, the earphones have to be near the, the uh, mic. So I don't know how you get the equipment. I'm gonna take, I'm gonna put Lila on the phone farther away, but I don't think that's gonna make a difference. And I don't think that's working either. I don't know. I can call back from WhatsApp if you think that might oh, help. Oh, no, 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 it's, um, you can still hear me, but am I really too quiet now? Like you can hardly hear me? Or is it, or am I loud enough and clear? Uh, Cause you know, sometimes you get this, I want the voices to be the same level so that nobody's like annoyed. Like one is like, it's like, hey, Pat, and the other one's like, yes, Lila. <laughs> so, and so you're straining every other person, you know. It's like, eh. but maybe I'll move closer to the microphone, and then it'll be too loud. So, anyway, 
Uh, about six months from now, I should have this down, but I don't know. I think I need to get a professional. Hum. You still hear the stupid hum. Lisa says hum. <laughs> it says, Molly says it's clear. Okay. Lisa, could you go over to Molly's house? Because she's having a great time. <laughs> Okay, anyway, Lila, first thing I want to ask you, because uh, this was one of your big topics, and I'm really curious to hear these theories you have about the Madeleine McCann case. Uh, because, you know, obviously I've been involved with the Madeleine McCann case forever, and I, of course I think I have a lockdown on uh, the evidence and the analysis of the evidence. And, oh, it's very good. Yeah, so I'm always curious if somebody thinks they have something to add to this, uh, you, and you seem to have a couple ideas and you said uh which i thought was really cool of you you said you you wanted to present them you thought they were interesting and you're willing to have me like squash them like a bug i mean no it's not quite what you said oh absolutely <laughs> oh no i'm ready for that i'm not attached <laughs> okay so uh, that's always a, you know it's funny because uh you know sometimes people do present things and i say as a profiler well here's why i don't agree with that and then they go all, yeah they get all been out of shape <laughs> so, so but I, you're, you come you come with a good attitude so um so i'm Thank curious you. to hear and then i'm going to see i'm going to have the see if the chat room is going to jump in and uh you know okay. have their thoughts on it so what is your what is one of the concepts that you have about the madeline mccann well, case that you think is interesting it's, it's it's actually not a new concept it just kind of combines two things when i came across the case i started watching i had heard about it years and years ago and oh how dare they accuse this poor mother then i started reading but this doesn't sound right but i only started reading a couple years ago and after going through spending more time watching videos than i even care to admit <laughs> i started there were a few things that didn't make sense to me okay. and i came up with this theory okay so there's the way i see it there's only two things that could have happened either an intruder came in and kidnapped her right. which to me seems patently ridiculous the last thing this guy wants is to have some screaming toddler <laughs> Well, what, well, well, let me ask this question, Lila. If you don't think Madeleine McCann was kidnapped, I mean, there's a bunch of theories about, well, why she would be kidnapped. One theory is that uh, somebody would kidnap her as a sexual predator. Second theory is she's being kidnapped to be sold into either the sex trade or to some poor woman who really wants a almost four-year-old to say, you're not my mommy. And, <laughs> and three, there's easier pickings. Yeah. And three, I'm, I was here to burgle your place, but you know, instead of taking your money, your passport, your watch, everything else you got here, I think I'll just take this, this child instead. Um, you know, the, which, or that, which may never made quite a lot of sense to me. So those were the basic ideas. You don't think any of those could be possible? Well, let me, I'll, I'd, like, I'd just like to explain a little bit. It's going to combine a couple things. So I, I just don't think even I've heard the uh, unbelievable theory that he was there. He's going to steal the camera. He has this, the camera under one arm, takes the kid on the other because she's a witness. I got to take the witness away. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah and the again, witness. the kid's okay. screaming. <laughs> Well, I don't know how he got. It. Yeah, it's it, it's you know it's it's one of these kind of preposterous theories. Which the thing is, you can't if you're looking at a case, you have to look at the possibility that she was abducted because there's only you know because that's one of the major reasons children disappear. One of the major reasons. So you have to look at it, but then you have to look for the evidence that she was abducted along with the possible motive. But even if you put the motive aside, you know, and you say okay. At this point, we don't have any evidence of what the motive would be, because we don't. Um, then we'd have to figure out how the person actually abducted her. Was there some evidence left behind that shows us that this happened? Um, and that that's then they ran into the problem of there wasn't any. You know, so then you have to say the child was abducted, but we have no evidence thereof. But we're going to assume it anyway. Okay, so... Well, well why would he? I mean, things like a screaming alarm bell for people to follow. It's ridiculous. Well, well the thing is, if you, again, I'm try, when I try, to, I try to help understand is how the police would work on this, or if I were a profiler, what do I do? I would say, to be, you want to do what I always call due diligence. So if you're, if you're doing an investigation, the thing you don't want to do is absolutely not look at something because you don't think so. So, I mean, I don't think it was alien, so we, I'm, I'm gonna say I won't look there. <laughs> but, okay, so I might have this theory, okay? 
And then I would say there is, you know, children are, the other theory is that she could have been abducted. There is no evidence of that. However, on the possibility that for some reason, for some reason, there was a way to abduct this child without leaving evidence, we should at least pursue some basic investigative avenues to look at that because we don't want to find out later we were wrong and we never even bothered. So you you know, so you want to put people Agreed. in that direction. So Agreed. to do the good job of, of that. Uh, on this on the other hand, which the the other the um, certain people don't want to happen is on one hand, if you're willing to look at an abduction that there's no evidence of, you should also be as willing to look at the parents, which there's more evidence of. <laughs> you know, so if you know why would you say you can only look at an abduction theory which doesn't have any evidence, but you shouldn't look where the evidence is? That that becomes an issue of something's wrong with what's going on. But anyway, oh, so, I totally agree. So now, now totally tell agree. me what your your thoughts were on the. Well, my thoughts are so. I don't think that anybody grabbed a, a, a screaming child and took her out, even if she was asleep. Or let's say he killed her and took her out. The last thing he wants to be caught with is the camera and a dead body. This just doesn't doesn't right. fit in my world okay okay so you're not going to do that then let's look at the parents so the parents they're out boozing it up they come in and the um theory is that she fell behind the couch positional asphyxiation uh they're afraid right. because they've left her alone they shouldn't have they don't call the police jerry takes her i do agree that um it's very likely that that second spotting that they did not That's want the police to investigate mm -hmm. it, you, you've got to ask why in God's name wouldn't a parent want the police to investigate all sightings? I don't Absolutely. care if you think that a, that, 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 that a, a teacup chihuahua took her. <laughs> they should investigate <laughs> all. That is absolutely true because one of the frustrating things I've had with certain cases is that they, they want me to investigate the most ridiculous possible suspects. You know, on the tiniest chance it just might have been them and they might look you know the dingo baby the dingo took the baby you know at least check out the dingo you know and actually the dingo did take the baby but they, they you know, did. They did. <laughs> but you know so if i heard of a child being seen in the arms of some man by the smith family i would be beating down the police door with a rock telling them you, you absolutely are you over that case and they'll say you know that looked like jerry and like, i don't care the guy looks like my husband fine find his find his doppelganger because he's got my kid but they I agree. didn't i agree yeah okay go ahead so you're going to look the, the parents are out boozing it up supposedly they get up every 20 minutes and check on her i don't know how that works because by the time you walk 10 minutes walk seven minutes check a few minutes go back it's another 20 minutes that doesn't make sense either highly unlikely so, <laughs> i i would think so yeah. so they um the theory one of the theories is they come back they find out that they shouldn't have left her alone she's something happened she's behind the couch positional asphyxiation mm -hmm. and then jerry goes off puts her in the shoals uh then they have to go and move the body later you don't want stray dogs running around town with arms and legs in their mouth or <laughs> buzzards swooping around the shoals you are very so i like your i like your very uh, descriptive there <laughs> it's very good <laughs> this is so, true though. so he has <laughs> so so let's look at this pat now bear with me i i am actually headed someplace with this okay. so in order to think they come back and these parents if they do that they got to know they're never going to have a place to visit their daughter the body is going to be gone forever but they they move her they're choosing the shoals they have to move her again pat this is enormous worry psychological pressure okay. i wouldn't steal a cupcake from Walmart, I'd be afraid that my face would be all over the newspaper the next day. I'd have a record. Right. The police sirens would be coming in. This is a lot of stress to disappear a body in a foreign country and then not do it once but twice. That in my true. mind, something. Good point. Something I like that. I, want to to, I just want to stop you here because I don't know where you're going yet, but I think your point, that point, is really good. Um, I don't know that uh, I've ever. Um, uh, what do I want to, what do I want to say went to that depth of the level of emotion and and thinking about the case and explaining it so I think what you're pointing out is really really good because you are, you're very very correct that one of the issues about like for example with serial killers it's easy to abduct somebody because all you have to do is look around and make sure nobody sees you 
But the problem with dumping a body is that you got a body with you and you're paranoid the whole time the body is with you. You're thinking you're gonna get stopped by the police, something's gonna oh, go yeah. wrong while you're burying the body. A teenager will pop out from behind the bush smoking some weed going, what are you doing, buddy? You know, anything could happen. A dog could run up from, the, you know, from somebody walking a dog. So you have to make sure that you are comfortable with where you're, where you're going with a body and where you're gonna bury it. But that, you're correct. That has to be the most stressful time for anybody. And if you're in a foreign country, don't know the layout very well, and you're under huge pressure, and they're, everybody's looking around, everybody is looking around, you got a problem. You do have a problem. And so I think the, the, con, the problem we've always had with this case, the most difficult part, has been not so much that, peop, that the evidence seems to point to the McCanns and the, 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 you know, the, the, the blood and cadaver in the, the, uh, the, the flat, and with the dogs and what could have happened there but then you're correct they, it's always been a little difficult to figure out what happened after that if it a happened how did they manage to do b and c which is what you're saying a okay but b and c very very difficult so i think that's a great point you made about these the stress factor that is really good well 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 explained well explained lila really good okay now go so, on <laughs> so in my mind these two are motivated beyond just a, a daughter behind the couch positional asphyxiation. Now, I'm not a doctor, Pat, but right. if I were in their shoes, which I'm not, and God forbid, I hope I never am, what I would do, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, you're doctors. Um, you know about what happens to bodies before and after death. So right. they, let's say they go out to eat at 8, they come back at 10, the kid's mm -hmm. dead, positional asphyxiation, whatever, behind the couch. Instead of going through this enormously stressful and you know, you've got to come up with a good excuse for walking around with your dead daughter's body in your arms at 10 o'clock at night if you're found, this is stress beyond my imagination. It's risky. A lot of chances. Okay. What's motivating them? So um, I look at that and I think well, well, something else has to be motivating these people. Okay. Uh, it can't. If I were these parents, what I would do, correct me if I'm wrong, it's a hey let's go to bed we're going to wake up in the morning call 911 the girl the little girl is behind the couch positional asphyxiation of course still we don't know what happened she was fine we all went to bed now hmm. i know from i can remember when i was four years old and i can remember my first hotel stay we were moving across country i was so excited after my parents went to bed i right. got up i went through the hotel room i went out the door oh my god it was a motel not a hotel i went into the parking lot I was four years old. Wow. Oh, this was so exciting. Right. Kids love to explore. So she could have gotten up. She could have seen lights over the couch or heard right. something fallen. And as far as the fear of some type of sedative being found in her system, six months after that event I just described, I went into my grandmother's purse and I ate her heart medication <laughs> because they were little you were red an ornery pills. little critter. <laughs> I thought they were M&M's, Pat. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so it's perfectly believable that she could have gotten to right. the, uh, what was it, second all? I don't know what it was. Had a little bit on the table, fallen behind the couch. We talked to the police. She was fine when we went to bed. Of course, they're going to do a time of death, temperature of the liver, that, this, that, this, this. That could be, I say, I oh, like oh, your, oh. Con your concept yeah, is oh, really but, good. But, but what, wait a second. They okay. can, I think that they could say, well, it was between eight and 10 hours ago. But they aren't gonna know if it's eight or 10 hours. That's, that is true. Eight hours, they're in the restaurant. 10 right. hours, no, other way around. 10 hours, they'd be boozing it up in the restaurant. Okay. Eight hours, they're in bed. I don't know what happened, we went to bed. Of course, they're in tears. I do believe they loved their little girl and that right. they were uh, sincerely just huge. Um, they were mourning her loss, right. sincerely. And it would be perfectly believable that she got up and fell behind the couch when they were asleep. That, Why didn't they go in this direction? These are doctors. Right. Let me think they, for one second. Let me think for just one second here. Uh, I like the point you make about the fact that if she fell behind the sofa and let's say, I, for, I, I can't remember, the, I, I personally can't remember the details of the exact timing here. Um, the, what the, when, the, when Jerry went, uh, what, what time was that? Was it? Eight, nine, which, what, 
somewhere around there? I forget. Yeah, I forget. I don't know. But whenever he went, the supposed, you know, that he was now outside uh, and Jane was rolling by seeing, you know, ghosts. And um, so let's assume she did go behind the sofa eight or nine o'clock, whatever. And she did die at that time. So, so essentially what you're saying, which I think is quite smart, um, very good profile, by the way, very good crime scene analysis and good, good, good theorizing. So she would be behind the sofa. They come home and say, oh my God, if we, and, and then they would say, well, if we call now, they're going to say, well, you weren't in the house and she died behind, she died. So that's absolute neglect. Um, they could, they could still play the drug card. They could. They could still say she got into something and we didn't give it to her. So, so therefore, the basic thing you get us on is neglect, um, not, not abuse or anything. It would be neglect. So they could, have, they could have gone with that. Or, as you're pointing out, if they just left her there and went to bed, didn't talk, do anything more, went to bed, and got up you know, fairly early in the morning and again, just making their coffee and they know it's, where the heck is Madeline and they find her behind the pit and they call for the police and they police come and they're hysterical which they would be anyway um, and we and you said exactly what you said you know we put her to bed um, we all went to bed uh, we maybe we were sleeping a little heavy because we you know we were drinking a little bit but um, but you know uh, and then I guess the only problem might be that they might get questioned about the fact that they did leave the children alone. Even if they, they're claiming she was fine when we got home and she must have died in the night, the problem is they can't prove she was alive when they got home. So the neglect thing would still be there. They could say, but you were out you know, in the evening and you weren't actually in the home. She was alone. So how do we know that she didn't die two hours earlier? So well, you, you have that same now. question with the other scenario of abduction. They still say, well, you know, that was neglect. You left her alone. Of course, that's even worse. She was the, abducted. Yes, but... She just the, didn't fall behind. Yeah. Well, see, there's a difference in that. And this is, this is a weird thing when it comes down to uh, for things, how would things would play out. First of all, if you neglect your child and, and she dies from your neglect, you see, you are the one and only uh. person responsible. However... The theory behind the abduction issue is this. Um, you did not expect a criminal to come into your home and steal your child. So the difference would be this, um, that because that is a, an anomaly and something that a, a, a per, different person committed a criminal act, they would probably not hold you responsible for that. Secondly, once your child is abducted, and this, this happens quite often, people ask, why weren't the McCann's charged with ne neglect anyway? Because after all, that is why she was abducted. Because even Jerry said, which I thought was amusing, he goes, we were sorry we weren't here the minute she was taken. And I'm like, which I didn't know, I think means she was taken from life, you know, she was taken, like died. But also, we're sorry we weren't here when she was taken. Well, dude, if you were there, she wouldn't have been taken. Right? Precisely. Yes. So, but here's what happens. When a child is abducted, due to some negligence, negligence, I can't speak, negligence of the parent, the, um, the authorities feel like they're already so severely punished by the child going missing, to throw a ne neglect charge on top of it seems excessive and makes the police look really bad. You know, you're, these people have lost, their child is missing and you're going to, you're going to what? Charge them with neglect and put them in jail? So they I won't they do it because they've already paid the price in the worst way possible. So that's why I believe they never charged them with neglect. Uh, but so the, I think the problem would still be that if the child, even if they called in the morning, they would still have the child being neglected and dying when they were probably not there and they can't prove that they weren't they may be not prove that they were but you know what i mean but you know also in the mind of the person um they don't know what the best result is going to be so when you go into a panic you don't sit there and necessarily say well i think what will happen is the police will think that they can't prove that we that she died while we were out because you know we said if we say we came home and she was alive and they can't pin down the time of death 
I don't think they're going to charge us with negligent homicide type of thing. Um, we think they're going to say we can't prove it, so we're going to just say it was just an accident. But you know, when you're in a foreign country, here again, you're in a foreign country, you don't know if they're going to put your butt in prison. You don't know if they're going to take your other kids away. You don't know if your whole career is ruined. You don't know all this stuff. So in a panic, because you don't know, you may roll the dice on whatever you know emergency decision you make. And it may be a good one, it may be a bad one. But you know, so it's really hard to get into the heads of people when, I mean, when you've just found your kid dead, you know, what is your response to that? You know. And what would you do if you thought you were somehow responsible for it and you might go to prison and lose your other kids? I don't, I don't know because I thankfully haven't been in that position. <laughs> you know? I, so I don't know. So, so go on from there. So, okay, so the one theory well, would be see, that why didn't they do that? Thing, oh, it, I'm, I'm going somewhere with this coherent, okay. trust I, me. I, I, so, I'm, the, I'm, I'm ready for it, yeah. The, the, but the thing is, yeah, they, you don't know what you're going to be charged with they couldn't prove that they were there then she was alive when they came back correct but conversely you they would not be able to prove that the girl was dead when they came back that is so true. who knows what they would have decided they couldn't prove we don't know which dead. way they would go though that's that's but, the thing no but you know this thing about moving a body and the possibility of getting caught and having to move it again and if they got caught there do, that would look do you know how many people times do worse. exactly that i mean that is a extraordinarily common thing that happens I mean now I think you might I think I might know where you're going with the, with the concept of why they would do more than just call so but go, so go ahead with that because I think I know where you're going well, with it and it's, well okay so uh, it, three things if you let me let the lay these three things out there were okay. three things that happened that made me think you know there's something there's some more motivation here to cover this up than okay that I'm seeing. One is, and this is the one we can most easily discount, um, and I don't know because I'm not married and I don't have the type of money I can just fly off to Portugal and have a vacation. But <laughs> one of the things that started me down this road, and it's the one that can be most easily discounted, was a photograph of the table. And the table, I think it showed a watch and a camera and a few other things. So you say, well, it, it couldn't have been a burglary because the camera's sitting right there. Right, right. And, um, but my immediate thought was, well, where's the second camera? They have enough money. They're married. I don't know. I'm not married. Don't married mm -hmm. couples each have a camera? The second camera isn't there was my immediate thought. Now, you know, that's, that can be thrown out the window. But I did have that thought. That's okay. And the other thought that I had was um, the enormous pressure. I just can't even imagine moving the body of someone I love. And yeah, a lot of people move them, Pat, but then they don't have that easy out, I'm sorry, relatively easy out <laughs> of um, being able to say, well, she was alive when we came back, positional asphyxiation, la di da di da Okay, there's two more things. The other thing is, and correct me if I'm wrong, when they went back, of course, this is far after the crime, I remember reading that they removed the tiles and they actually found some blood underneath the tiles, that there was blood in back of the couch. The, okay, uh, I, now, you know, it's, uh, I, I know I've been an expert on this, but it's been years and years since okay. I get delved into the details. I, and I have not, you know, I don't remember. I do well, know that the, I've, the, the cadaver and blood dogs both hit behind the couch. So there did. was there was evidence that there was blood behind the couch but i don't know if there was i can't remember if anybody in the chat room can remember this because i'm i'm blanking whether there was I, I ever have... found any actual blood or was that something that would have been cleaned up um and well, they the did try to i heard that they that there was a smell of bleach that they had tried to clean up when the police came i heard that okay i can't and i, do I remember... cannot remember this it's just okay like... <laughs> and I, I do remember something about removing the tiles and evidence of there being blood. And my immediate thought was, and forgive me if I'm wrong on that point, that's what I do remember okay. hearing that, although I could have read it in a source like you've pointed out to me before was not the best source. Right. So um, if there's enough blood now, Pat, as a child, I banged my head really badly three times. I have pain in my head to this day. I'm 68 years old. Mm -hmm. I banged my head really badly three times and on none of those occasions was there blood right I mean, you just because she fell behind the couch 
and I do remember that there being blood, evidence of blood, even a little bit of flex on the walls. Right. Okay. Blood. Well, here we she's... go. Let's say uh, Lisa's coming on the suit. She's got to say, well, the dogs targeted the closet and that area behind the sofa. But we're talking about, we're talking about blood issues. So go ahead. Okay. So there's, I remember reading that there was evidence that there was, that she bled, that there was blood there. But you're not going to bleed if you just bong your head. So that's another thing that made me think. You know, what did she do? That it, there, you have copious blood behind the couch. It isn't just. Well, I don't know that it was head. copious. I mean, I, I don't. Oh, think... Oh, okay. Really? Enough I'm blood that it got underneath my... the tiles. Oh, <laughs> I'm pulling out. I'm pulling out. Uh, my, okay. Uh, iPad now. Okay. Let me see if I can. Because I say I'm just blanking on this. Um, let's see if I see anything right away. I'm out on the can. Uh, blood behind couch. Blood. Blood. Blood behind the sofa. Oh, they like to use the word sofa. Ah, I call it couch. Ah, my East Coaster. Okay. Um, uh, well, see that. Let's see. Okay. Was blood found? Traces, traces of blood have been found in the holiday. Now, this is coming from the Guardian, which is, of course, a useless rag anyway. The traces of blood have been found in the holiday apartment. Madeline McCann was last seen. The blood was discovered on a wall in the holiday apartment uh, by British sniffer dogs trained to find remains of bodies. Okay, that uh, that's not telling us a lot there. Um, the smell blood. They smell blood alerts. So trace. The McCann's voice. The McCann's voice insisted there were innocent explanations for the traces found behind the sofa. Uh, I, 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 I'm not coming up with any copious amounts of blood or anything. I don't remember that. I do not remember that. I mostly know that the the the, the, the dog hit on that. Um, because the well, copious. Yeah, the interesting part about the general generality of if the dog is correct, right, is. You're right. I, I, I would think it would be odd that a small little, you know, a kid is bouncy little thing. Um, the chances of the kid falling in and having copious amounts of blood, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go with at all. Um, the, the positional fixation, yes, that's very possible. Uh, then the question would be, did the child slip and hit herself enough for the most minor amount? Because you know, the dog's hitting on anything, so it could be three drops of blood that could be it could be that minor but i don't think if, i don't see any evidence of anything you know tons of stuff there at all um well i i said copious because i had read it was underneath the tiles so my theory was if it got underneath the tiles it's more than just one drop if you see what i mean yeah i, I just, I just don't know that i ever okay. got that information let's see what lisa says my point is there had to be blood or some protein there for the joist to signal yes there had to be, but the question is, is a lot of this trying to point out is that how much are we talking about? And then the question comes down to, okay, so, and this gets really tricky. So I agree with you that generally speaking, you would not think that a small child just tumbling onto it. It is, a, it, it is you know, she's going behind the sofa. So it's not like, uh, it's not like she's falling and going whack. No, like completely whacking either because if she's getting stuck behind the sofa, that means she's getting stuck behind the sofa. You know what I mean? So it has to be close to the wall in a situation where she's trapped in a, a bad position. Uh-oh, I think I just lost somebody. Did I lose you? Hello. I've lost, I've lost Lila. Lila's gone missing. Lila. Oh, here she's calling back. She's calling back. <laughs> Lila? Yeah, I'm sorry. I oh, just connected okay. myself. It's a new phone. I'm not used to it. No, no, it's it's okay. We're 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 good. So hey, if the phone dies and you call back, that's fine. It's when the internet dies that I'm in real trouble because <laughs> then the show goes down and then I'm like, ah. So um, Mo Molly, uh, no, the dogs were not cadaver dogs. One dog was a cadaver dog. The other one did do blood, but um, so so but the point being, if you can get a, a fictional positional asphyxiation that would mean it's a very tight area that you're getting trapped in if the area is extremely tight it's unlikely that you fell and whacked yourself because you had a free fall because how would you have a free fall if it was positional asphyxiation good point. right good point yeah so that would not be now the possibility is 
uh, I, I might have to look this up myself, um, what other things could have caused blood? And it could, there could be a bunch of possibilities. She, she could have scraped herself on something to cause a small amount of blood. Uh, a nosebleed could cause blood. Um, I don't know. I think the more concerning issue is a cadaver dog hitting behind the sofa because, you know, in a sense, let's say, let's say the kids had played around or even say adults were playing around, you know what I mean? It's possible that somebody cut their finger and a drop went behind the sofa. You know what I'm saying? Could have happened, and maybe even before the McCanns got there. You know, somebody could have, you know, held a wine glass and then they, they had a, something and there was some blood dropped. You know what I'm saying? Anything could happen on that sofa to cause a little blood to go behind the sofa, theoretically. But the cadaver is a problem because there should be no dead people behind the sofa. You know, and, and nobody had died in that, in that apartment. It wasn't like, oh, you know, last week one of the clients died, you know, and was behind the sofa. And the, the oddity of being behind the sofa in itself is really strange. So that, I think the cadaver thing is much more concerning than the blood thing. Now, oh, course, I agree. Yeah, now, of course, they're going to say that the cadaver dog was wrong. If the cadaver dogs were, if the dogs were completely wrong and there was nothing going on behind the sofa, then we have, then, then you might say there's something else happened, right? Um, somewhere else it happened or somebody else came and took her because she didn't die behind the sofa. There's no, there will be then no, well, there were, there were other, pla other places that cadaver dog hit. So there you go. So that's, it's not the only place. It's in the car and other locations. So but if you discount the cadaver dog completely, you could go with an abduction theory, except that the McCann's behaviors still don't work. And I have more problems, I think, in the long run with the McCann's behaviors. But, okay, so now you're saying, okay, so let's go back to your, that was two, and I thought that those okay. were really good. What's and your then, third and one? The, the third one is just so weird that I just, I, I never was able to get over it. Mm -hmm. I believe Kate wrote a book, and in the book, she talks about discussions she would have with her husband, and she said something that was so... I just, how does a parent have these thoughts, let alone discuss them? Right. She said that she was, she talked with her husband. Now I may have the words wrong. She was plagued by thoughts mm -hmm. of, and I believe these were the words, correct me if I'm wrong, her beautiful little genitals right. being ravaged right. by some bad guy. That is what correct. She did, she parent, did write that in her book. That was what? parent is going to think that let alone discuss it and put it in a book well i know this this has been one of the things that has led to a sexual abuse theory on, on the whole case uh because that uh, people have that issue they do uh about that and there's a, a bunch of other things which i i will not at this point entertain because i find them I find them questionable in their sources, so I won't entertain the other concepts of supposed sexual abuse. Uh, however, however, she did write that, so you're correct. It's a very, it is a bit of a strange thing to write. However, however, and I stick with evidence again uh, because there is no proof that we know of that there was any sexual abuse of, of Madeleine McCann. We have no proof of that. Uh, that she wrote that. Uh, who knows maybe Kate's that maybe she's you know she's thinking of how every perfect part of her little daughter's body and she is able to entertain that horrible thought and that she put in a book is concerning but you know I think Kate has a little bit of a problem understanding how other people view her I think that's a level of narcissism uh, because she says things and she doesn't seem to understand that other people are going to go that's weird you know and it doesn't matter that, you know, for example, uh, the fact, you know, when she was able to do makeup and, and, and jewelry and go jogging was always a problem in the sense that that's a not normal behavior for a parent who has a missing child. Uh, but it is more common for a parent who already knows the child is gone. So she's not actually thinking about, you know, what's happening to the child. She also said she could sleep after a few nights. And I thought that was astounding. Because yes. if your child is dead, yes, you might just go to sleep in exhaustion. But if you think your child is out there and something's happening to her, I'm going to tell you, I probably wouldn't sleep from 
for a, a year, you know. And if I, even if I fell asleep for a few minutes, I'd wake back up again in a panic, thinking, oh, my God, what's happening to her now? Because um, I mean, I've woken up thinking about that with animals, you know what I mean? Oh, my God, is my yes. animal okay? And I jump out of bed and I go running because I thought I left a door open of the mouse cage or, or, you know, whatever. And I jump up to check on something. If I could do that for a, a mouse, I would think if my daughter were missing, or my, uh, and I'm thinking the whole time somebody has her and not in a nice way, I, I wouldn't be able to sleep. So that always struck me as extremely odd, which is why I thought she knew she was dead. So not that she was grieving, but she knew she was dead. Um, so when she went to write this, you know, did she write that from the from her heart, or did she write that as a, let me describe something that would sound like I was worried about her being raped? I mean, did she do that for that reason? You know, if I do, if I say that, then they'll think that I thought she was alive and thought something might be happening to her. Is it is it dramatic? Is it too dramatic? You see what I'm saying? Uh, and then she just yeah. didn't realize it was going to come off really badly, <laughs> which it did, which it did. Um, but I don't know. I, all I can say is that is not proof that the child was being sexually assaulted. Uh, but let's let's say I, th I think I know where you're going with it. So so go on with your theory as if this 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 had importance. We don't know if it does or doesn't. But if it had importance, and and sometimes when you're doing theory, you might say this: if the if A is true, and B is true, and C is true, where where does that lead us for an investigation? Because then you can go look mm -hmm. that direction. It doesn't mean that necessarily A, B, and C are correct because you're, it's a, a murky gray area, right? So you're like, so, but if A, B, and C is true, then let me go see if D is true. Let me just check it out. So I'm going to, I'm, I want to see where you're going for, for D. Well, you see, I look at these things that don't make sense. Her vivid description of her little daughter's genitals. This right. is beyond weird. It is. Um, there's blood behind the couch. And, and I, as a head bonger of many years, I never dropped any blood. Uh -huh. uh, it, I put all these things together and I came up with what I call my two mints in one theory. And okay. just bear with me, Pat. I'd sure. like to describe it. It's, uh, it, maybe it didn't happen. You're free to shoot it down. But let me describe what I think possibly okay has a chance of having had happen. Okay. So the motivation to get rid of that body seems to me beyond positional asphyxiation. Something else happened. That, My theory, right. it, it, okay, so they come back and they're going to be accused of child neglect and you're in a foreign country and they could and lose they, children the child and is, occupations. This is obvious yeah. evidence of sexual abuse. And this has been brought up by many. There was the, the belief is that if there, if there was evidence of sexual abuse, this would be the massive motive for not allowing her body to be found in any way, shape, or form. No, I, I don't think that there was sexual abuse. Okay. Uh, let me let me tell you what okay. I think. I'm may curious have happened. now where it's okay. going. Okay. So you have you have this theory of an intruder, uh, and then you have the theory of the parents, and to me they seem way over motivated for a positional fixation. Okay. What do I know? I know nothing about this world. If there's anything worse, okay. So let's say an intruder comes in and the intruder wants to steal something. He sees the two cameras, he takes a camera. A little girl comes running out of the bedroom. Well, if there's anything he likes more than the camera, here's candy on a stick right before his very eyes. Like you yourself said, a certain number of these ne'er-do-wells are also gonna be pedophiles. So he takes off after the little girl. Well, I've been a little girl before. I've been in, in a situation not being chased, but being that size and remembering, okay. The first place I'd think of hiding, and I've seen videos and photos of this room, I go hide behind the couch. Okay. So she goes and runs behind the couch. Okay. Well, the big guy just pulls the couch apart, and he has his fun with her, kills her. Uh, he does things that we can't talk about on YouTube. Right. Now he's in real trouble. Takes the camera and leaves. Okay. If there's anything worse than coming back from your dinner to find out that because of your neglect, there's positional asphyxiation, it's coming back and finding out that because of your neglect, your daughter has been assaulted and murdered. Now you are in real trouble and I, there I is so. no way no, out. I, you I, don't I disagree. Think so. Okay. I disagree. Okay. First of all, first of all, there is zero evidence of an intruder. And we got to stick with that. There is absolutely no sign that an intruder ever got into that house messed with anything into that in that house and certainly if he had done all these things and attacked her there will be evidence so if you came back and found your child raped and murdered 
you are not you the neglect thing as i say it's going to fly right out the window nobody's going to care about that because all you're going to say is the kids were asleep in the house and we just we, we we keep checking like they said and we came back and we found this happened to our daughter people would be they, they okay some people on the internet are going to say well you should have you know you left her alone to get raped okay but that doesn't matter. The police are not going to charge them. They're going to go after the killer, the rapist. They're going to get way more sympathy. They never don't have to do any of this body moving stuff and all of that. No, I, I don't. I don't believe that's that they would have. They would have had an excuse n to call the police. Then I really think so. Uh, okay. And there's no evidence of an intruder. And see, this is the problem. And that that in therein lies. The, there are two major issues. When I did my uh, my by uh, five, the five big clues in the Madeleine McCann case. I, I point these five big clues out, and now I'm, I can't tell them off the top of my head. But anyway, um, oh, one, one is that, uh, it may not be these, but I'm gonna point, throw them out. One is that I know for darn sure that, 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 that flat was not unlocked. Jerry locked that flat. They were using keys to get in and out. They didn't leave the children in a situation where they could be attacked. They didn't, they locked. And only after they wanted to make it an abduction do I believe that then they said, oh no, we, we then used the sliding door. But the, he originally said the place was locked. Uh, secondly, that there's no sign of an abduction whatsoever. Third, the Smith sighting is a, I say is a big, huge key. Um, and then, I can't, can't remember the other two right now, but when you take the big things, it eliminates it, it eliminates the other things, but I'll tell you one thing it doesn't do. Um, I can't go with your theory just because I say there's no evidence. That guy would have left a lot of evidence if he had done that. There would be much, and they would have called the police. I have no question. So the two more likely things, and I'll give people credit on the concept that if, if she had been sexually abused, okay, in any way, then yes, that would give them even more motive to move her body so that that wasn't found out. But I just say there's no evidence of sexual abuse, so I'm not gonna go there. Um, one one problem with armchair profiling, which I'm very much against in general, I'm, I'm not against to understand things and discuss how they work, but the problem with armchair profiling is that as a, as a profiler and as an investigator, I might look into abuse issues okay but i'm not just going to say oh it had to be she was abused that's why they got rid of the body and come up with something for my investigation that i haven't been able to prove so armchair profiles have a tendency to come up with a theory and say that's what it is when they're not going to be investigating this to prove it true or not true they're just going to throw it out there you know so um so i don't know i've, I've never found any evidence of abuse in the, in the in the mccann case at all uh from what i could see they loved their kids they took them on vacation. They had a fun time with them. They were neglectful. I think they're arrogant. I think they're uh, very, I think, I, I, Jerry, I find highly controlling and possibly with a personality disorder mile wide. I find he controls Kate. Um, so he, to me, is the one that I'm looking at because I think Jerry is kind of cold, cold kind of cold-blooded. I think that he came in and found, due to their neglect, their child had died, due to giving them her drugs and then having her you know, fall behind the sofa and die. Um, he may have made a what he would consider a rational choice under those circumstances. In other words, if we, if we that we call the police, we're in trouble. We may get, we may end up in a foreign prison. We may end up losing our children and our license, medical licenses and A, B, C, D. But if she disappears, we will be, we will be the victims. Uh, and therefore, he made a decision because he thought he had to make a decision. Now, I can't prove that, um, but uh, you know, if I were doing an investigation, that that would be due to his personality and the, and the events what I might be looking at. It would help if we'd found her body, <laughs> knew where it was, uh, you know, so there was proof of anything. But um, but there was, the, the, I have to throw the abduction theory out uh, just generally because, or anybody entering the apartment and doing anything to Madeline because there is zero proof. And the things they did when they got in, the things Kate said about the window and all that stuff was, was baloney. 
and I went to Portugal and we proved it was baloney. I was there um, and we were at, we're at the uh, window, Peter and I were at the window. We actually were at the window of the McCann's and we, we pulled up the blinds. So, and it was garbage. Nobody ever messed with that window except for them. So nobody got through the window or came back through the window and the house was locked down. So how did they get in? So there's just no evidence of an intruder. So that's, and then their behaviors after that prove that they didn't seem to think their child had actually been abducted. So there we got that problem. Now, what exactly happened and why they made their choices, I, I honestly don't know. And we can't know because we're not mind readers. We weren't in the situation. Um, so I don't know, but I, I like your point about how difficult that the emotions on, you know, is it, you know, the fear you would have of trying to move a body and hide it. And, you know, um, I, I, I struggled with that, Lila. I really did, uh, especially the double move um, because now, what may, yeah, I really, I really, I, I did struggle with that. I did. Um, so, and I can't, I can't say I have a clear way of feeling, comf yeah, knowing what happened or why it happened. Um, it would appear that the Smith sighting might document Jerry taking um, Madeline toward the beach, which would be where he would leave her and come back. There was, the, there was the point that the McCanns went out by themselves toward that beach area and the Roja Negra, uh, and, and that's where I went and did, I did a, I went up on the Roja Negra and there's, there's just areas on there where you can, you, can, you can put a body and cover it very easily in the crevices. And it's also right near a parking space. So if you wanted to move the body, you could pull a car up, take the body, if, especially if it's, you know, and then put it in your car and drive off. Uh, but I, I, you know, I don't, I, I say here's some scenarios, but I can't lean heavily on that. Uh, when people say, well, you know, I know what happened to her, I'm like, yeah, I, I, I'm not absolute on it. It's, you know, because yeah, we we haven't found her. So what are we gonna do? Um, oh wait a minute, <laughs> Lisa's saying I'm so frustrated I can't talk. Wait a minute, let me look what Lisa's. We got a whole pile of things here. Okay, let's uh, just so we can see it. The wife husband wife relationship was odd. Well. Oh, Annie's here. Hi, Annie. Where's Annie rolling? It's a terrific discussion. Um, let me let me go back. We got so many here now. I gotta go back and look. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Oh, okay. This is interesting. Lisa's got some interesting thoughts. The guys that stole in the carpet maybe cut themselves. Yeah, that could happen. And in a, in a, in a, you know, because you got that little exacto knife of thing. Very unreliable theory. To me, blood being behind the sofa is a non-issue. I think her scent is more reliable. I agree with that. Um, then, Annie says, terrific session. Hey, Annie, hi. Um, oh, let's see. Let's see, Lisa. She spoke as though she wanted to make sure what she was saying was approved by Jerry. That is That happens all the time. That it seems like he is controlling what is going out to the public and you don't screw up. Just don't screw up. Yes, he does seem to be very controlling. Indeed, he did. Um, and yes, uh, the question about the what Lila said about the unfortunate description of uh, uh, Madeline's parts, yes, that is in her book. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, okay, let's see what this motive is. Isn't it a motive they used excessive sedatives to get the kids to sleep? Seems more likely than abuse. Okay, the this is that is the theory that they may have over medicated um, the children. And then once they, see, once they, if they came in and found one dead child and it's sedatives, then they would have tested the other kids right away and found that they'd sedated all the children when they went out. It doesn't make them look good. I think, you know, I don't know in another country what they would have, you know, and if they overdosed her, you know, Madeline, and, or the medicine they gave her, and this is, this is where I think it gets tricky. And this is why I think they may have decided they couldn't call the police. If they gave her enough medicine that she went to look for them and because she was disoriented she she fell and died and they found there was that the medication was a contributing factor to her death then not not it's not only neglect now you've got possibly you know a manslaughter charge you know, maybe it's unintentionally led to that but you know you might end up with a manslaughter charge and that that could really not end well uh, let's see what else other choices um, Molly, I think it was all about them. They wanted a kid-free evening for a dinner with friends. 
They want to self into self-preservation mode when ended in catastrophe. I, I tend to agree that that, I think, is the most likely thing that happened uh, because they had a lot of other choices than leaving their children medicated and locked up, uh, especially that age. Oh, my God. I can't imagine. And, that, you know, the, 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 the claim that the children were like in the, they were like in the backyard. No, they weren't. Um, uh, they weren't, <laughs> uh, and they weren't even of an age where they could do anything. Like my my granddaughter's eight. I live right next door to her. She can run down the stairs into my house. Uh, yes, she, uh, there's a couple times I've done the show where she goes upstairs, but she's first of all eight. She knows how to come down the stairs. Um, she also knows how to pick up the phone and make a phone call, which she has the phone. Um, so. Could something happen to a child when you're not in the room with them? Yes, they can hang themselves on the curtain. Kids have done that once in a while. They could theoretically fall and, and bleed out or something. Something horrible could happen, and I wouldn't know. She could fall down those stairs, break her neck, and lay there. And I wouldn't know because she was on her way to get me. Do things happen in your own home? And um, I can tell you a story of uh, something happened to me when my son was a t little teeny baby walking about. And you know how they always say, don't leave a bucket of water around when you got little children? Well, I didn't know there was a bucket because I, <laughs> let's face it, I don't, I don't do scrubbing. <laughs> you know, that was my ex, my ex-husband. He was a scrubber, you know, so he did the bathrooms and other things. Well, I didn't know he had scrubbed something and he had a bucket and it was about this much water in the bottom of the bucket. I didn't know he had taken it into the laundry room and left it on the floor. Meanwhile, my son was next to me by the sink and he was toddling around on his little feet. He toddled out of the room and he went around the corner. And then I heard the sound. It was, eh, eh. I'm like, what is that sound? Eh, eh. Well, I walked around that corner and he was doing a headstand in the bucket. And thank God he was able to push up because his nose was above that water level and he was able to make sound. But can you imagine if he had gone around that corner and didn't, and the water level was oh, an inch higher, he would have fallen in that bucket and drowned and I wouldn't have probably noticed for five minutes or whatever that he wasn't, you know, he was right next to me. I would go around the corner and find him with his feet out of the bucket and dead. That can happen that quickly, even if you're right there. However, that's called an accident and it can happen to any child. However, what I wouldn't do is leave a, so I wouldn't, when my granddaughter was three, I wouldn't have left her next door and then then gone down to feed the animals in the field and she's alone three years old in the house she can't she can't get to me she can't find me she can't call she can't do anything and i'm in the field for 30 minutes or 40 minutes feeding animals and leaving her completely alone i'm not i would not think that was a wise idea so maybe it is bedtime so what am i going to do dose her up with a bunch of stuff and then put her in her you know and then lock the door and run away for an hour you know that's neglect and so if they overdosed her and the, the over the, or the medicine, even not even overdose, but if there was enough medicine in her system for them to think she was, you know, a little groggy and out of it and therefore caused her to fall, then they could be, I think that would be a contributing factor. So I think that is a major thing. Yes. And this could be very true. They could lose their medical license. Um, and I don't know how all that would have worked, but you know, um, yes. Uh, did she admit she didn't now, Kate did not admit to medicating the kids what happened was um, I think it was called Calpol and there's a big argument over this but they did use Calpol and this it's like I forgot what it is in the US but anyway what was interesting about this whole thing was that when if Kate did not admit to medicating any children However, somebody did say she'd done so in the past, okay? But we can just say, okay, let's say that was just gossip or somebody was mistaken. The thing she did was when she found, when they called for the police and everybody was there, she kept going into the children, the twins, and she kept putting her hand on them to see if they were breathing. Now, admittedly, you get paranoid about your children, but this isn't a baby. The, the twins were two I believe right they were two years old so they're not talking about infants and you know sometimes you do put your hand on an infant to make sure they're going like that but she kept checking them for breathing why why were you checking them for breathing because you were concerned that whatever happened to Madeline could have happened to the the kids could stop breathing because they got too much of something so I found that 
behavior very interesting. Um, uh, Lisa says maybe she was medicated, woke up and looked for her parents outside the window and hung herself on the curtain cord. Um, I, I don't know about the, hmm, I'm trying to think now, whether there was a curtain cord there, but uh, uh, that's possible. I mean, if there's a curtain cord behind the, um, behind the couch, maybe, um, that was there and she got tangled up in it, that could happen. Um, I, I can't remember what was in the room right now behind the couch. Clearly her body ended up behind the couch. Now, some people will say somebody stashed her body behind the couch, but, you know, that's just not your normal place to hide a body. So I don't believe that for a minute. Um, I believe she, that if, if she ended up behind the couch, it's because she fell behind the couch. So, um, so anyway, uh, I think we've caught up with all the, the other comments. So, so that's where I stand, Lila. I think that um, there just is no evidence of an intruder. So I think that... Although, if I were the police, I would still be looking just in case, you know, I would. Um, just to do due diligence, I'd say, you guys keep looking to see if there's anything here that we're missing. That for whatever reasons, the McCants are a bunch of whack jobs that do everything wrong. Their behaviors are completely crazy. And the guy got massively lucky not leaving a shred of evidence he entered the home and left with a child or killed the child there. <laughs> you know, just in case. It's an anomaly and like a 5% or 1% chance Let's at least put a guy on this to you know, see what he can find out, see if there's anything there. But what's interesting is, you know, once once Gonzalo Amaral wasn't on the case anymore and, and, and the UK got involved, essentially, you know, they, and they got the remit for Scotland Yard that said, we are not looking at the parents. This is, we're looking at an abduction only. That's when it all went out the window as something's fishy here because you've got no evidence of an abduction and you've got far more evidence on the parents. So why in God's name would an investigative agency do that? You know, why not look at both? If you really want to be just fair, just look at both, you know? So I find that really interesting. Did you have another theory in this case? <laughs> oh, no, that was it. I appreciate oh, okay. you shooting it down and showing me where I'm wrong. But, uh, <laughs> I, I was unaware that there was that much lack of any evidence of anyone Zero. else being in the room. It, that makes sense. Absolutely but, uh, nothing. Yeah. And Oh, uh, and I never thought that uh, the guy took her with him if he did it. I always thought that that sighting of Jerry, that that's what happened. It was just the impetus between him taking the body that made me think of this. Yeah. No, I, th I think the, the part I love about your thinking, which is why, by the way, I have no objection to, if you were working on a case, um, I think it's excellent when people have, have more of a team effort so that, because you will see things from your background that are different from my background, okay? We're all different people. So sometimes you just don't think of something. You know, another person, I, I, your description of their state of mind and trying to move a body, I think is excellent. I think that that really makes me stop a little bit and think, why would they do that? You know, because that is, you're correct, that is the most stressful time. Um, the only way I think that I have to look at Jerry, that's the only way I think I can explain that is because Jerry is a very, very controlling and kind of cold-blooded guy. So, you know, some people have the capability under, you know, oh, it's almost like a state of war, you know what I mean? And in that moment where everybody else is losing their minds, they can very calmly go do the things that need to be done, even under massive duress. Uh, he may be one of those. Um, and when I look at my own family, for example, if you put my sisters in the room with me, uh, when something's going wrong, they will both look at me to take care of whatever it is. Anything highly emotional, where I've got it, like when my father was dying and stuff like that, it was, I was the one that dealt with people. You know, they, they dealt with um, like discussions and stuff. If something serious had to happen, I ended up doing it. I ended up telling my, I, I was the one they asked to go home and tell my mother my father had died. And why did they pick me? Is it because I don't care? <laughs> I have no feelings? No, it's because under extreme duress, I'm very good at staying calm. They're not. And so I am. And so that's, I'm, that's just what I, I'm really good at that. I don't know why. Um, and my, my daughter is very much like that too. And she was an, so she worked as a, in, with the ambulance in, in the first part of her, her life. Um, and, and I know that I've seen her when something goes wrong, she can just kick in and 
do things very methodically and very, you know, you know how when your happiness comes up, the people are so calming because they just know what they're doing and they, they tell you, okay, we're going to do this, this, this. And you, 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 they, you feel less fear because you feel like they can handle everything. My daughter's like that and she became a cop. So, you know, she was, I, I used to do ride alongs with her and man, it was amazing how good she was. And she took me because she knew I was also very calm under, under stressful conditions. So worst conditions I can be dead calm. So Jerry may have been, had the capability of saying, this has gone wrong. We're going to lose everything. Nobody is going to see me do this. Kate's still over there. I'm going to take her and sneak down the, because right behind the, right behind the, um, the, the flat they're staying in, there's a dark lane. It's kind of, you know, it's like you can go behind the building. It's where the, where the uh, deck, uh, I don't know, come out of the back of the house, where the sliding doors are. You can sneak down there. And then at night, it's very, quite empty on the roads. So, and it doesn't take long to get to the beach. Now, he ran into the Smith family, which I'm sure will be really un, not a good thing to happen, you know. Uh, but then it just hoped that he was not identified and it just looked like a, another parent taking a child someplace. Um, that would be the unfortunate thing, but, and then decide to move again, maybe, you know, for whatever reasons. But he's, I think he has the ability. Kate, I do not think has the ability at all. I mean, I think, I think she, she freaks out, you know, and so he's the one there that says, stop it. And then he takes care of things. So that's what I think. Um, oh, here, I, I want to point this out. Uh, Lisa says, I agree. Lila had a great point about them needing a strong motive for the complexity of what they probably did. Yeah, you know, I, and that's the second thing, uh, Lila, I just want to say that. First, I love the fact that you think, though, that, 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 that moving the body part was very, very, that's extremely stressful. Secondly, what is the strong motive? And I may not, I may think that the neglect and the, the possibility of them being, you know, the, um, uh, the medication pushing that over to possible, you know, manslaughter or something else, and the loss of the children and their licenses might be enough for Jerry to make that choice, but maybe... Lila, maybe Lisa, you're right, right that maybe there has to be a little bit more that, that pushed, pushed them to that point. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. And that's why people have brought up sexual abuse. Uh, that would be unfortunate for if that happened. Um, I, but I don't know. Uh, and therefore, I haven't gone there because I don't have evidence of that. And a lot of people go down a whole bunch of rabbit holes on that one. Make, you know, bringing in whole sex groups of sex, you know, they're swingers and then everybody's playing with the children and then she was killed three days before and they carried around fake bodies and I'm like, woo, <laughs> you go off the deep end, you know, so I don't know if there's a stronger motive, but it's worth thinking about what that stronger motive could be, but we don't know what it is. So that's where we're kind of just, one of the things I try to do with profiling is that you have to know when to stop, essentially. Uh, there's a lot of cases. I was just talking about, some guy came on, he was doing the, um, the Panama case where the two girls went, you know, hiking in, the, in Panama and went missing and 10 days later they were found dead. Well, there's people there who think that they were kidnapped and, you know, and then they were raped and then their bodies were thrown places and all kinds of stuff. But the basic facts of that case don't support that. The basic facts support that they got lost, they got injured, they couldn't get back, they, and they died. And the evidence of, that they have with them, they still had their backpack, their phone, their money, and it just nothing made sense that they'd been abducted and raped and, and killed. So I point that out on, in the video, but then here's what happens. Somebody always comes in and says, but what about? And I'm like, you know, you can spend the rest of your life on the what abouts, <laughs> you know, because we're not investigating that case. And, you know, we don't actually know all the small details. So when somebody says, what about a bleached bone that was in this spot? I'm like, I don't know. And I'm not going to waste my time thinking about it because first of all, I'm not solving the case. I'm not down there solving. I'm not working on it. They didn't pay me to fly into Panama. <laughs> Darn. But, you know, there's always these little things that we're never actually going to know. And so I stick with, stay with the most major evidence just to understand the case and then we have to leave it in the hands of, of the investigators. And uh, unfortunately, this case is, has its bizarreness because of the interference of the government. Uh, it, is, it is one of the weirdest cases as far as why they didn't pursue proper, why the UK got involved. And, and Scotland Yard spent, what was it now, over, I don't know what it is in uh, pounds, but like 20 million of them uh, going nowhere, accomplishing nothing. And now we have a, a, 
what looks like a fake suspect in Germany. What is the heck? What, the, what is all this political stuff? I don't know. But I also don't think it's because there's a massive child sex ring across Germany, Portugal, and, and UK, which all ends up, you know, kidnapping Madeline and protecting uh, Jerry. And, you know, that just gets too wild for me. So I'm just sticking with what's very, very basic. Uh, let me see, oh, wait, I want, did I read this, Lisa? Is he a surgeon? Well, you know, he's supposed to be, but then some people said he wasn't, so I don't know. You need your surgeon to be calm under pressure and almost cold-blooded. It's an advantage in some situations. And that is true. Uh, my son, when he was five, had a horrible bicycle accident, and he flew off a bicycle in a yard, and um, he hit a little teeny tree, and the tree stopped the bicycle, and he flew off, and he, he slammed his face into a, a sandbox, which had just been built like a day before. <laughs> Lucky kid. And, and it ripped open his face and smashed his eye socket and messed up his jaw. And the, the surgeon... He went to a coma, came back out. He, sat the, he was in the hospital, children's hospital. The surgeon comes in, and he's really excited about the, the surgery. And he had, like, zero bedside manner. But he was, like, he was excited. He's like, this is a fascinating case. And then he was telling me what he was going to do, but he was so into the surgery and all the technical things he was going to do. He was, like, excited. It's like, he, oh, my God, you just give me a, 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 I know, a, a, a new, um, a dupe, uh, what am I trying to think of? Um, shoot. Uh. Oh, crap. The little blocks she put together. Legos, Legos. He's like he, he's like he got his new Lego set and had 5,000 pieces. And I remember sitting there thinking, you're talking about my son like he's a project for you, like some kind of cool project. And I was really thought, oh, my God, it's, it's horrible. My, this is my little boy. And, all, you know. and then I thought, do I want a guy who's so, super empathetic or do I want a guy who really wants to build my son's face? <laughs> so I went, I think I'll take the guy that wants to build my son's face even if he doesn't have any feeling for the kid. And he did a great job building my son's face back. So uh, so that's correct, Lisa. Uh, sometimes it is it is a personality thing, uh, you know, and so he may be able to handle certain things that other people can't handle. So, And now, Lila, you had some other, you had two other cool subjects, which I wanted to get to. Cause yes. I thought, oh, I, I, I I agree with you about surgeons. That was my experience. That the, oh, really? uh, I shattered my wrist, and they didn't have to open it up. They did this weird type of surgery where you hang the wrist and put the person to sleep, and he does it with an X-ray machine and pounces really? them all back. But the guy, that was exactly, I was talking with my friends who were there, and they said, well, it, it, he looks at you like a box of Legos, and he has to put <laughs> yeah. it back together again. Right. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I think that is what they think, some of them. And I get it. And the other thing people don't understand is that, you know, if you're doing surgeries day after day after day, what you do is you disconnect from the emotional yes. part, just like the police. Yes. You can't go to every crime scene and have a, you know, have a, have a breakdown, an emotional breakdown. Or you're in the wrong business. And I always joke about the, the these criminal profilers like John Douglas, who I got into the mind of the serial killer. And, and then I had a, had a, I, I, mean, I couldn't handle it anymore. I had a breakdown. I'm like, dude, you're either lying to sell a book well, you're in the wrong business because yes. I haven't had that breakdown yet because I know how to understand that when I'm viewing the minds of serial killers. I just did a show. I just did a I'm, – I'm, I'm doing a television show for – that's going to be out. I've done five five uh, episodes of the television show. Um, and I'll find, when I find out what it is, I'll, when it is in the U.S., I'll let you know. But I've done five different episodes on five different serial killers. And one of the serial killers I just did, I mean, when you read his stuff, you're like, oh, man, you are a disgusting human being. And the things he did to the victims were not pleasant, you know. But, you know, I can read these things. I can talk about these things. And I'm not having a mental breakdown. I can also see the photos because I've done that a lot um, because I've learned to just, you know, to separate myself from my, my professional stuff to my personal stuff. And um, you, you better be able to do that in certain businesses. Otherwise, you're... You know, you might not want to do that in other, other, other circumstances where you need to have more empathy and emotion, and then you don't want some cold-blooded person <laughs> you know, talking to you like, you know, like a teacher. Maybe you should have a little bit more warmth. You know, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, you know, that's that's the way surgery is. Um, let's see what uh, Lisa says here. I've had a lot of to do with surgeons recently for my own son. And last month, the surgeon came right to me after the op and showed me photos. He was so excited about his work. Oh, my God. <laughs> A bit yikes for me. Oh, my God, that's funny. Yeah, I never got to see the photos of my son. But that might have upset me. I, I, I see what you're saying because, you know, 
the only time I felt like, um, you know, when, when, when you're dealing with, I used to work in the hospital so much and I see all kinds of, I've, I've watched surgeries in person. I've seen them cut people open and stuff. I've done that. Um, and the only thing that ever made me a little dizzy, oddly enough, was I had a sick iguana and I had to pick up my iguana and then I had to use a, uh, <laughs> I had to do some cleaning with this, this Q-tip in certain areas. And, and th that made me actually queasy. And I'm like, I, I work at a hospital for years. Why am I queasy doing this to my lizard? But there was something about it because he was my pet, you know, and I was, you know, doing intrusive things to him. So, you know, I think, I don't know if I'd seen photos of my own son's face surgery I would that would not maybe have bothered me you know because it was my son not somebody else's son so so Lisa so you said uh, a bit yikes for me Whew. yeah yeah so but yeah I can see the search it's like God, I'll show you this it's really cool <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah thanks guy <laughs> did he at least uh, Lisa did he at least ask you do you want to see the pictures or did you just throw them in your face because he was so so no, it came right to me after. Oh, it came right to you. So, I know. I was just curious if it even asked if you wanted to see them before you, you know, just pray to them in front of you. That's 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 funny. Oh my God. Okay, so Lisa. Uh, so Lila. Okay, the next one. Tell me, you had two other subjects. Which one do you want to talk about? Oh, there but I, I did want to tell you how right I think you are about Jerry being a narcissist, and I think that his wife is also one. You. I think he might be a little over the narcissistic level. <laughs> well, didn't didn't you say that narcissists? always think that they're the smartest person in the room that they're smarter than everyone else so maybe that's why he he thought he could get away with it because he's so Correct. much more clever he than is very else. manipulative um i don't think she's so much that i think she's more like she's concerned about herself you know that she's got that level of you know wanting to come off well and wanting to be you know taken care of in a certain way i think she's got some of that and she's also wants wants people to look at her well, uh, but she's but the things she says are so off that I think that she's got that level of narcissism where she doesn't see that people, you know, that people aren't seeing her the same way. But Jerry is definitely way out, way over. He might be a little on the. I I, I, I can't say he's a leaning towards psychopathy, but you know, it could be close. You know what I mean? To the point where he he does indeed think he can control everything. He's smart as hell. I'm going to make this happen and. They made so many mistakes, and this is one reason I try to tell people, whatever happened to Madeline, it happened that night. Nothing happened the night before or the day before that where they had time to plan. It was such a mess on that night that it had to have happened just then for it to be such a disaster. Otherwise, if they had time to plan, they would have, but I think everybody was free. They were freaked out at that point and trying to sort of cover, cover up what actually happened. Um, and so that's why their statements don't quite make sense and that why their statements change and you know just things aren't just things aren't correct i mean it, it you know and it just it isn't just that they were emotionally upset it's things don't come together properly no, so i, I think, keep wondering what he has on who in the government that they're going to put out all this money to protect them it doesn't make any sense the governments have changed and come and gone nobody's in power who was in power when this happened yeah. except for queen elizabeth and i don't think she has anything to do with it <laughs> no i mean she's being blamed for a lot of things too you know uh i mean it's the royals um oh lisa lisa has to head out so she's just she's saying goodbye gotta go now bye bye lisa she says thanks lila for great points and great responses from our expert see you all next time uh and and also molly says enjoyed your comments lisa yay um that's the, what this is about um yeah you know the the royals uh, the same thing happened with um Mm -mm -mm -mm. Um, uh, uh, Savile, okay, Savile. When I, I did the show on him, and one of the things I noticed was that people were saying that the reason he got away with what he got away with for 50 years was because the royals were involved. And I'm like, the royals were not involved in anything he did. The fact was, he was a very, very famous person, very popular person in the media. And so when the royals came in contact with him, they only saw that little teeny piece of him. They weren't like hanging out together, you know what I mean? They weren't spending tons of time. They just saw the little, you know, outside portion of him and, and the public portion. And, and they they also went along with the ride. The royals are, are, are human beings. They see things in the media. They get excited. Uh, he was 
uh, he was getting massive amount of money for good organizations. They're doing massive charity work. They're supporting that. So the royals were not involved in anything that happened with Savo. Um, it's just they they're just they were in their positions, and he was doing whatever he's doing. So no, I don't believe that you could get the entire UK government uh, and, and Scotland Yard and now Germany to all be 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 Jerry's bitches. You know what I mean? I just, I think that's ridiculous. I think you know, sometimes what happens with, 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 with things that people don't get is that politics and, and humans, they sort of like, it sort of roll, you know what I mean? So this happens and then this happens and this happens and this happens. It's not like it was all planned, but things just happened as time went on. So when this happened in Portugal and UK, one to say, oh, you know, you know, what are you doing with our citizens? They came in and then all kinds of egos got involved. Then there was the media making money off of it. So everything had a part in all of this, but not necessarily a coordinated part where they were trying to protect him. Um, so I don't, I don't believe that at all. Um, I don't know quite why it all went the way it did. And but, you know, I've seen other cases where people think, like, for example, there's police corruption. And I'm like, no, there was some police incompetence they're trying to cover up. Yeah, there's, that happens. Uh, somebody's running for office, and so suddenly they solve a case, you know. <laughs> but it's not, you know, a lot of times it isn't because it's this big, huge machine. Not that there can't be, but usually it's not a hu as huge a machine as people think. Um, it's just it's uh, some unethical characters within certain certain areas that then get a hold of things and do what they feel will work for them and so it gets um but then you know it gets blown out and that's that's one of the reasons i have an objection to um uh, uh, um, is it hall richard hall who does all the videos am i correct because i keep blanking on his name um richard isn't it yeah he's done like the whole set of videos on the mccann case um and the first video he did was very very good and then he went down the rabbit holes and he, he has like massive amount of people he claims are all linked together in this huge conspiracy it's just it's just like you know no <laughs> no but you know it, it entertains people it gets them you know excited and you know when you start linking things together for people it makes makes for a great story which is usually sup should stay in the fictional realm you know where you, you watch a fictional movie and you know probably that wouldn't happen in real life but it was an exciting movie, you know. <laughs> so I, I object when it's done with real cases where you know rabbit holes are dug and people are encouraged to go into them, and and then it just gets insane. So, but yeah, yeah. I, th I, don't I know. think we just have to go back to Occam's razor sometimes. Yes, exactly, exactly. That is generally speaking, people aren't as brilliant as everybody thinks. They try to do things, and a lot of times they just get lucky, you know. Uh, people say sometimes, how did a person get away with it? luck so one of the cases I, I, I talked about um, <laughs> it, it's amazing how how much the guy got away with because of sheer luck and incompetence both together there was luck and incompetence and he was able to have a he, he, he killed women for 12 years he was eventually convicted for 16 uh, he, he may have killed 67 women that's the, maybe the top total for him and he got caught on a traffic stop because the idiot drove drunk and a dead guy was in his passenger seat. So yeah. <laughs> that's how he got caught. But up until then, I couldn't believe how incompetent everything was. I'm like, oh my God, are you not doing what you should do? And and each, each, each agency wasn't talking to the others. And then they got together like, you know, so they got together a task force, but the task force like really didn't have a good methodology. And they, got, they brought in some psychologists that were idiots. And, you know, it's like, a big huge mess and because of that the guy just kept going you know and he just and so a lot of times that's what it is and especially when you have cases that can become very difficult to solve you're missing big things like we don't know where Madeline's body is that's a fact we have no clue certainly isn't in the German dude's basement because I dug that up you know <laughs> wherever it is if they could only find her body it would make a difference summer wells if only they could find Summer Wells' body, it would make a difference. So, you know, but when they don't have that, then, then, then you have all kinds of theories, but you have no evidence. So what are you going to do? You know, and you just keep hoping you, somebody, you know, cracks and speaks or, 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 you, or you come up with a body and the body has the evidence to connect it if it hasn't been lying around for so long in such a place that you can't 
figure out what happened. So, yeah, and it happens in a lot of missing children's cases that the children's bodies are just simply never found. And you know, what do you do then? Uh, baby Lisa, her body hasn't been found. Um, uh, who's the, the, so like, I could, there's like tons of little kids whose bodies have just never been found. You know, they're small, so it's easier to, easier to hide them than the big people. <laughs> Well, Pat, you mentioned that Seville was caught due to a, um, being stopped by the police. Didn't both Bundy and son of Sam get caught in the end because of a no, parking Seville, I wasn't always That was nothing to do with Seville. Sable? Are you huh? talking about Sable? Sable, I'm sorry. Oh, no, he wasn't caught. No, 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 no. That had nothing to do No, no, what I was talking about with all the dead people. Uh, well, no, that's a serial killer. Sable's not a serial killer. He just played around with some. No, I mean, girls. well, you said that he got caught because of a No, he didn't. Sable never got caught. Oh, no. then who are you referring to? Huh? I thought you said someone got caught because of a dead body in the back. Oh of the yeah, car. because he killed he killed seventeen women, and uh, I was I was not mentioning the serial kill just because I was trying not to mention the actual show I was doing. Oh, so, I see. There, there was okay. a little like don't don't talk about the show before it shows. So I'm just saying there's one out there. He killed he killed at least sixteen women. That's not Sable. Sable just messed around with young teens. Um, he didn't kill got anybody. It. He died, and then the 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 media went after him after he died, and and dug up all this stuff. So you can look, we can watch it. I have a whole video on, on Jimmy Sobble. But yeah, Ted Bundy got, you know, a lot of serial killers get caught because they make stupid mistakes. That's the number one way they do get caught. It's not because of brilliant investigation. Um, you know, the FBI has never been very successful at catching serial killers. People don't realize that. They, I, mean, I, I always ask people, okay, what serial killer did they catch? And nobody can come up with any. I think Atlanta, the Atlanta serial killer, uh, that's the only one I think they proactively were able to help catch. Now people say it wasn't the, the guy that they got, but but ignoring that, uh, that people say, I, I'll do a show on that one day. The FBI, if you look at it, they didn't catch Ted Bundy. They didn't catch the Green River Killer. They didn't catch the Long Island serial killer. Where have they been? For all these serial killers out there, you got the best task force and profilers in the country because it doesn't work. <laughs> Your methodology doesn't work. That's all it comes down to. <laughs> so, oh, Rif, oh, he said Rif, Rif, Rifkin also, yes, Rifkin also got caught that way. So many of them. Uh, let's see what this is. Was taking a body in his car was stopped by a cop for a broken rear light. Yeah, a lot of uh, psychopaths have problems keeping their cars up to date. So they'll have bad tags, broken taillight, those simple things. And when people object to the police making traffic stops, this is sometimes the things that are useful because a lot of these guys who are doing bad things have a problem with their vehicles. So the police have at least a legal leg to stand on to stop the vehicle to find out if there's something wrong. And so traffic stops have always been extraordinarily helpful to find for, to find uh, Serial killers, uh, cr other criminal behavior, drug 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 dealers, stuff like that. So, you take away the ability to stop a car, you take away a lot of our law enforcement's ability to catch bad guys. So, yeah, <laughs> but there's a lot of those guys with never never you know. But you know, but you're pointing out again, Lila. The most stressful time is when you have the body in the car. So if you're going to move the body that you just the person you just killed. I'm sure if you're a serial killer, you just killed somebody. You know, the easiest way to do this is to leave them where they are. So if you kill them in, in you know, on a jogging path, pretty easy. Just leave them there and you walk away, right? That's the better way to do it. But if you bring them back to your house and kill them, now you've got a problem. You've got to get them out of your house. So you either have to bury them in the, put them in the walls, like some do, bury them in the backyard, put them in a <clears throat> crawl space, um, or you have to put them in your vehicle and drive them away. And once you do that, you've got to get from point A to point B with a dead body in your vehicle, you know, in the in the seat, in the trunk, wherever. And you cannot afford to be stopped. You know? <laughs> no. Bad things happen if you get stopped, you know. That's when you get caught because, you know. So at least put the body in the trunk because, you know, unless they have a, you know, unless they, you know, you don't consent to a search if the body's in the trunk. But, hey, Ted Bundy, here's stu stupid Ted Bundy. So, you know, he, he, he got stopped. And they asked to look in his trunk, and he, he said okay, because he, they asked him what he was doing, and then he gave some phony story, and they asked to look in the trunk. The body it wasn't a body in there, but it was a whole rape kit in there. So, you know, how stupid is that dude? So, you know, thank God the serial killers aren't always that bright. Even the smart ones make stupid moves. So, yeah, because the one that, one that got caught with the body in his car, actually he was a very high IQ guy, 
very high IQ and uh, that he was brilliant in school. But apparently, not so good at getting rid of bodies. Cause <laughs> he had three instances with victims where he, the two before that, he should have been, he should have been caught, but they let him go. So, but they knew who he was and they ignored him. Crazy, craziness. So anyway, I want to go to one of your other topics. Which one do you want to? I'm sorry, which one? Which one? You had two other cool topics. Um, one okay. was... Was that my theory on why serial killers appear to have prolifer yes. mm. I want proliferated to hear during the last half of the 20th century note, I say, appear. Well, my theory is, you know, all of a sudden, you know, growing up, and it gets to be 60s and the 70s, and you have Ted Bundy, and then you have... Um, Who's that guy in Michigan? I should know his name off the top of my head. Not Wisconsin, uh, the guy who killed uh, so many gay lovers. Yeah, um, uh, uh, yeah, the one clown, right? Oh, that's John Wayne Gacy. That was in the Chicago area. Oh, okay. And then you have the the guy in Wisconsin who killed thirty six oh, people in his Dahmer. apartment and ate them. Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer. Yeah. And all, all of a sudden, it seems like, especially with the advent of Ted Bundy, serial killers are proliferating as though they weren't always around and if they were around they weren't around in such great numbers i have a theory that has two sides to this one okay. is that they serial killers thrive on killing people they don't know in fact i've read stories where if the girl tries to get to know him tell tells him her name he'll shut her down don't i don't want to know anything about you they have a they don't want to kill someone who seems like a human like no, their they, sister they or their that. friend no no that's not true no well, anyway. No, they're like, no, that that's sometimes um, this is there's this theory, and I think it's a bad one that you can talk a serial killer out of killing you. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, the funny thing is, how many women tried to do that and got killed anyway? Are they True. around to tell us it didn't work? <laughs> well, they, really. kill, they kill strangers. They don't kill friends. They kill don't kill people they know. Usually the they kill strangers. The reason they do that isn't because so they, they like get their caught. friends. It's because they'll get caught because there's a link. So mm -hmm. they pick strangers because there is no link, and that's why serial homicides are so difficult to solve. Because you're like dead girl in the bushes. You're like, you know, who do you think it was? <laughs> you know, but you know, you have a you have a situation where they get the Gabby Petito situation in Brian Laundry, and you know she doesn't show back up home, but he does. You know, you kind of have a good clue who killed her. You know, so a serial killer usually does pick. Um, total strangers sometimes he will pick a workmate if they he's not caught seeing you know with that person uh he might okay. pick the lady down the street that you know like you know, teenagers will often pick an elderly lady you know a few a few houses down because he doesn't have a car um so he might do that uh but generally speaking uh, and they will be they will pick up people in bars prostitutes hitchhikers you know that's the easier group or they'll sneak into their houses at night and kill them in their in their beds. Uh, so yeah, they prefer strangers only because that doesn't link back to them. Not because they care about people. You know, they'll kill their own sister. Well, they wouldn't care, <laughs> except she pays the rent. <laughs> got it. Well, that was a small part of my theory. That okay, keep going. When the when the nation was less populated, there was less strangers. Everyone knew each other. Harder to hide. The other part that's is that's very true. Wait a minute, Lila. That is very true. The smaller the community. The more interactions between the people, you're going to have less of that. There's less anonymity, and and when you get to the point where you've got people moving around a lot, um, and you've got uh, you've got cities, you see more of that. And there are there are times in history where there are more serial killers than we think there were, but the papers didn't pick it up and the cases weren't solved. So that did exist, but. Um, it seem, does seem like it's, 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 it's gotten worse. So, yeah, but I think your point about anonymity and more, the more people you have the, and the less of a, a little town, what everybody knows everybody, I, I believe that's true. I think you're correct on that. Well, my, the larger part of my theory is we're existing in a time where there is still war, but previous, well, we had the Vietnam War, before that the mm -hmm. Korean War. We have World War II, which left how many, 16, 20 million dead all over the world before that World War Right. World War One. Before that, we have not too shortly before we have the Civil War. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a French American War. There's the Civil War. These left legions of people dead. My theory, mm. probably shoot this down too, is like. that when if you have a propensity to be a serial killer, 
you didn't need to go to bars. You didn't need to hide. You enroll in the army. There were no cell phones. There was no instant camera. Right. You go around and you kill people. You could just even go into a town and do all sorts of terrible things to the women and children in the town. Nobody would know you're in part of the army. You're there to kill. Right. So serial killers had a, a cover. They just enlist in the militia, in the military. Some, some and did. they could. Let me expound on that because it's, 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 there's two sides to that, which I think are really important. One is, which is just kind of a funny thought, when you have a lot of war, you get rid of a lot of young people who could be serial killers. <laughs> you know? you, oh, you're eliminating the population of serial killers if they were, if they, in other words, you know, if you, ha- you would have had 10 more serial killers, but you wiped them out in the Civil War, you know, uh, that's, that's one thing. So you have less young men available to, you know, to commit crimes. Uh, your point about uh, an outlet, essentially, a, a kind of a, 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 shall we say, a smorgasbord or buffet of, of victims. Yeah. You know, um, there is a point to that. I, I, had a, I had an interesting thought about, do you remember the, the, the guy, this American sniper guy? Yeah, there was a movie made about him. It was a book and then a movie. And he ended up getting shot and killed. But they really bragged about him being this great guy, you know? And I'm thinking, the dude was a sniper. <laughs> and then when I read his, his behavior, I'm like, that was a, in my opinion, he exhibited psychopathic behavior and he found a great way to commit the, the, the murders he wanted to commit by becoming that, That's what I'm trying to sniper. say with this theory. Right. And this, I do believe in that case, it was very true. Because when you're a sniper, you it's essentially like being a serial killer. Um, now, there is this truth too that um, when you have violent psychopathy, right? If you look at different cultures, you'll find that in certain cultures, that violent psychopaths have a place to go. It could be in war. It could be with terrorism, right? Nothing better than a, you know, hey, I can go blow up buildings, people, towns, airplanes. <laughs> that sounds good. Um, uh, the the cartels in in, in Mexico and in Colombia and places like that. Uh, the cartels are a great place for violent psychopaths to hang out, uh, to kill people, to kill, you know, uh, other cartel members or people, you know, politicians, journalists, whatever you're going to knock off. So you have a way to get the thrill of killing in that particular culture. So I agree with you. I think that's a very good point to point out. So the more opportunities these kind of people have, the more helpful it is to them to be able to have a legal well, legal if you're in a war, illegal if you're in the cartel, but you know what I mean. So uh, an outlet that is not your just personal thing you have to do by running, you know, chasing down joggers. Uh, the only thing I would say uh, to add to that, because um, I think it's very true and I think it's a great point, Lila, is that um, that some psychopaths are chickens. They don't like to be challenged. They're not very brave. A lot of a lot of serial killers are not brave people, and then when you meet them, you go, "Well, the reason they pick the victims they pick is because they can kill them and torture them without actually risking anything." You know, in other words, they're not the ones that get into a fight with somebody because they don't like losing. You know, so they pick a guy, a big guy, picks a a young woman and hits her over the back of the head. He can't lose. You know, so. And, and uh, one, one of the serial killers I was looking at, um, he sedated the serial, well, like Dahmer. Dahmer said, come back to my place, you know. Then he sedated the guy and killed him. Dahmer, have you ever seen how big Dahmer is? He's a, ween, he's a wimpy looking little dude, right? He, he killed people because he made them unable to fight him at all. So he would never take a chance. So a lot of serial killers are chicken craps. They want the feeling of power and control, but they don't have the, bra- the bravery so a lot of them actually don't want to be in the military because they don't want to get shot at. They're, they do not want that to happen to them. So, so, there, it's, there, so it's different kinds of um, mentalities. So I would say to some extent, yes, war does provide a way for certain violent people. But for other serial killers who don't want to take that risk, they would still prefer, you know, knocking off, you know, women in the bushes. So, but it's very, that's very true. I think... There is less opportunity these days. I will totally agree with you. I think there's less opportunities these days for that that kind of person to find an outlet. That's a legal outlet. 
and also gets rid of them if they just, you know, <laughs> say, we just have a few more wars, you get rid of a lot of those psychos. <laughs> wait, wait I want to see, I want to see what Lisa has to say. Uh, she's popped in here. Oh my goodness. Okay, wait a minute. Um, well, this is, this is some interesting points Lisa's making. The advent of the industrial era made people feel isolated. And yeah, that, that was, I think that was definitely, you know, an issue. Um, oh, by the way, you know, what you're mentioning, um, I just saw a movie my, my son mentioned, uh, like, uh, which was Apocalypto. It's a Mel Gibson movie about, it's supposed to be about the Aztec empire. And, and it, the, the point being there was that they, the, the people, the people that were kind of in charge and were psychopathic, right? They they would you know abduct and capture a whole bunch of people from another another group, and they would then they would then take them up there and sacrifice them on the in the temples and have their heads you know cut their heads off and let the heads roll down and do atrocious things to them. So they had a legal outlet for being really sadistic, and that was okay within that uh, society. By the way, he loved the movie. I hated it. I, I really hated that movie. And by the way, it wasn't very. They were they, they were trying. They were actually saying it was Mayan, and it was. They had even people from uh, that part of Mexico representing. They were actually the actors and actresses. It was supposed to be about the Mayan culture, but it looked more Aztec to me. But I, I hated the movie. I thought it was a very poor representation of um, Central America in the days. But that's my point. Let's see. Lisa says I understand your point, Lila, but I disagree. Uh, that's an interesting point. Okay, serial killers love to stalk their prey, then kill them. It's not just about killing. Okay, wait a minute. Now let's see. Okay, now the now the sniper thing. You are stalking your prey and killing them. So snipers really kind of go into that category, don't they? Um, as far as it, the stalking part, um, some serial killers indeed like to stalk their prey, but a lot of them are pretty lazy. They, they, they don't, they, you know, they don't want to work that hard to find their prey. They really don't. They're just like, look, they have a trap, essentially. As soon as that person just gets in their trap, they take, they, that's it. They don't even care who the person is. It's just, they get that person. And that's when the thrill starts for a lot of them. So in theory, it isn't, I think the problem that a war would do for a serial killer is that he wouldn't be able to control the enjoyment of how he kills them. So I think your point is that more, um, he wouldn't, get a hold of them and then decide if he wants to rape them and then shoot them. Now, now mind you, rape happens in war a lot. So psychopaths who are on the, who are out there will often rape everybody in the village, you know, because they can, you know, that does happen. And then they kill them. So in that sense, if you had that bent, you know, they, they, you, you might do that. But there are people who do that and are not serial killers because they will actually do that only during war. And when they're, when they're home, they won't do that. So, in other words, there's a weird thing that happens in war where that the 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 opposition just become meaning meaningless to you and actually just repulsive to you like like rats or you know I love rats so I can't use that I'm trying to think of something I don't like <laughs> um, but you know some kind of creature that you have no love for and you don't have any problem destroying that creature even if it's a baby or if it's a woman or if it's an elder. It's like it's okay to rape and kill them because you just they're just disgusting creatures. Uh, they're like zombies to you. You know how people love zombie movies because you want to kill all the zombies, right? If you if you get into the minds of people that the people you're fighting are the zombies, like if you're in uh, you know in your Vietnam and all the Viet Cong are zombies, then when you get into the village, you don't feel anything personal toward any of those people. You don't understand that that woman that she's a she she's a mother. And that she was, you know, she, all she wants to do is take care of her family and she wants to cook. And if you came as her guest, she would feed you. But when you see her, she's just a, she's, she's just a zombie. And so is that little zombie baby. So you don't mind smashing the zombie baby's head. You don't. It's, it's, the child is meaningless and, 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 and serves no purpose. So there are people in war that, that because of the conditions of war become that thinking so that if they were not in war, they would not commit those, those kind of horrific acts. And sometimes when they get out of war and they have committed those acts, they have trouble living with themselves because reality returns, you know, different reality returns, and they realize, oh my God, those were people that I, that I slaughtered. And sometimes they don't do well with it, which is why we have a lot of um, vets that um, have emotional and mental problems. So um, 
So, so I want to say, uh, Pat, I'm learning so much from you. All these little nuances and bits of information that one can't get through books I learn here. Oh, I'm glad. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, there's so many ways to learn things from everybody. Uh, and, you know, so everybody has something to offer in that. Uh, Lila, do you have any other theories on the on the serial killer stuff? Because I do think no, that absence that of was war it. is, is it, it, it lends a whole different possibilities. Yeah. You, oh, Gavin De Becker. I want to hear what you had to say about Gavin De Becker. Well, are, you, are you familiar with Gavin De Becker? Oh, uh, absolutely. He wrote uh, okay, The Gift of Fear, which is a wonderful yes. book. I recommend that That's to fantastic everybody. Book. Uh, he was, he's a, um, um, he is a threat analyst um, and security guy. And uh, it's interesting. Somebody was just telling me that Park Dietz uh, also talked about, like, I'm one of the very few people that has a particular viewpoint on mass murder and the media and we shouldn't be giving them infamy because that's what inspires them so i won't do any shows in the mass media where i give their talk about the particular guy his name his face and all about him um and park deeds apparently uh uh also has that thing and i did not know that and i didn't know anything about gavin de becker's view on mass murder so well, i'll, I'll, I'll so tell I'll, you what i didn't his even look is, lala i didn't even look it yeah. up I was waiting for you to come and tell me. <laughs> but it's, and I've been saying this for years. I have this friend who's very, well, he passed away. God rest his heart. Uh, he was, oh, my God, did you hear there's been another shooting? I saw that. I said, oh, Dennis, uh, this by is, the way, this is, today, in yeah. case you haven't heard the news. Yes. yes. I, I just about sick. It's sickening. Um, uh, yes. uh, a, a guy went to the elementary school and killed a whole bunch of children in the third and fourth grade. And uh, the police did shoot him dead. Um, and it's just it's appalling and i just read that before and i was like mm, yeah so go ahead I, I said to him i said dennis don't look at it i said you don't understand what they're doing this isn't news this is advertising they are advertising haven't yes. you noticed this since the first incidents happened they've proliferated because the news is advertising and they reach these young vulnerable children they feel like they aren't important they have a mm -hmm. something's wrong on their head they have a chip on their shoulder i can do that too i'm gonna do that too and then worse when they get the guy you see him escorted out with 20 different FBI agents all wearing bulletproof vests that say FBI, or he's escorted out with the sheriff and a phalanx of police officers. Like, man, this guy is such a bad dude. We have to have 50 of our top men to control him. Oh, yeah, he is the man. He said, no, you don't do that. What you do is you allow the media to take pictures. You do what's necessary. You have to inform the media, but you allow them in to see the perpetrator, uh, I'm sorry, the suspect handcuffed to a plumbing pipe in mm -hmm. some, you arrest him inside, he's handcuffed to a plumbing pipe near the bathroom and there is only one guard. Yes. And you make sure, brilliant. listen to this, one yeah. guard, it's a police person and you make sure it's female. <laughs> I love it. And that's I the only photos you allow fantastic and then instead of thinking oh man they're going to see my penis is as big as their penis no <laughs> they, you right. have this wimpy looking guy chained to some type of toilet pipe with a female guard standing by his side he said hmm. those are the only photos you allow and you will see that they aren't going to want to end up like this guy right. because he looks weak and powerless and you know the you know the adjective i've always tried to get them to use and they always think i'm wrong for wanting to use it you know what my adjective is when you talk about don't use this name but you you know what you should call him? Hmm. A loser. Uh, very true. A loser. Oh, yeah, and that, they're like, that's, and that's they're like oh, you shouldn't do that. You're like, you're like, uh. Well, he is. I'm like, no, you understand that they're trying to be, they think they're a hero. They see themselves as a hero. You got to take them off the hero status and to call them a, an absolute loser. Now, coward, I hate the word coward. Do you know why coward is inappropriate? I, I, I hate this word. They use it with serial kills. They use it with mass murderers. They use coward all the time. You know what the problem with coward is? Mm. He knows he's not. Do you know how much guts it takes to actually commit that crime? I'm going to Can tell you. Imagine. To actually armor your, arm yourself up and go into some place, knowing you're possibly going to die at the end of it because, you know, a good portion of mass murders do get shot, right? And, and, and a serial killer is always worried about getting caught because he's committing the most horrific crime ever he, it's not cowardly it actually has a level of 
amount of bravery to be able to do that. Now, the, the, the claim is he's, too, he's a coward because he can't face life as a regular person. He can't do anything with life. But he already knows that. He already knows he's a loser, right? <laughs> so that, mean, that means nothing. So when you call him a coward, he actually doesn't believe it. He thinks you're being an idiot because he knows, hey, what are you talking about? That was the one brave thing I ever did. So don't call him a coward. Call him a loser. You're such a freaking loser. Exactly. That's all you can do. I think that's, exactly, I, I think that's exactly what De Becker said. A loser. A complete oh, loser. Oh, did he really? You I'm going to have talk to read about up them. now. I'm excited. You don't you talk to them as as oh. like, oh, we caught this guy, and we have we have fifty of our best men out looking for him. We're gonna like, catch him before like they the evening's over. Like they needed fifty guys uh, to get the loser. Just, no, you say this is this. Oh, you oh. tell them, ah, uh, it's no big deal. We're get we're gonna get him before the end of the day. The guy's such a complete loser. Oh, That's I the way you talk it. about him. Oh, absolutely fantastic. Yes. And I, I love this. I love the picture of him being handcuffed to a plumbing pipe with a female standing guard. That I just is love it. Absolutely beautiful. So, so what they ought to do is say, "We don't even need to tell you this loser's name." So never. So right. This is this is uh, after. Oh, the I think call, he says that too. Yeah. I, I may be mistaken, but I think he said you don't mention his name. You just call him the loser. I'm going to look him up and see everything he said because I started fighting this after the Colorado uh, mass murder. I began to realize that we in the media. And they were calling me. I mean, I made a lot of, I did a lot of shows on mass murder, okay? Because VPI, I remember the VPI case. I was in Minnesota in the VPI case, and the phone calls started coming in, like boom, 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 boom. And my, my sister suddenly said, There's, the phone is ringing off the hook, because I was living in her house at that time. We were, I was staying, we were staying together. And I'm like, what the hell happened? You know, because I knew if they all rang off the hook like that, it was probably mass murder. And sure enough, it was VPI. And I remember, holy crap, I was in the studio because in Washington, D.C., I would go from CNN over to MSNBC, over to Fox, right? I'd move from studio to studio. But in Minnesota, they're an uplink studio. They don't, you know, that's not a major place. So they don't have all the studios there. So I would have an uplink studio. I would sit in that chair and they would say, uh, CNN coming in now. I do CNN. And then they go, okay, MSNBC coming in now. Now you've got UK coming in, Sky News coming in. I sat in that chair. I started somebody at three o'clock in the morning and just roll. And Pat Brown, what do you think? What got this guy to do this? And at that time, you know, I was newer in this and I, you know, I, I fast, you know, I have my interest in understanding mass murder, right? It's part of, it's part of profiling and psychology. Um, but so I would I would do what you know that was what we did. So I talk about that. And then I started thinking, you know, these guys are killing because they want to beat the last guy out. They want to be more famous than that guy. And look how much we're doing in the media to show his face constantly and his name and 24 hours a day, talking about this piece of loser, this total loser who yesterday people wouldn't even know remember his name in school, is suddenly. On, on air 24 hours a day. So I stopped right there and I said, I'm not going to do it anymore. And so then they, they would call me up and they'd say, Pat, we'd like you to do the show. And I would go, I will come on to talk about mass murder in general, but I will not do a segment that uses his face, it shows his name. And then they'd always dump me. So all of a sudden I, got, I lost like a huge amount of business because I just got dumped off of every show. And the, my, my famous show is the CNN show. And maybe I'll link it again, where they asked me, asked me to come in and I said, you know, I haven't done this in like 10 years because I refused to, and I this is my thing. And they said, okay, and they let me come in. Apparently the producer on the show, some young producer forgot to, t she let me come in in spite of the fact they promised that they wouldn't talk about anything uh, with a guy's name. And then the host of the show to start right into it. And she obviously was never informed. And I said, hey, wait a minute, you're breaking our agreement right on air. And everybody's like, <laughs> so it's a very funny show. Uh, and so that was the last time I ever spoke on it because they messed up. And, uh, but I stuck to my guns on that. And then recently they called me and they wouldn't have me come on because I wouldn't do it. Uh, I was, I know I was dumped. So I get dumped a lot, uh, you know, cause I won't talk about it. Um, but I think, yes, I think it should be across the, uh, across the board policy that we talk as if, if something is going down, people need to know it's happening, but you do not show the guy, you do not use his face. You just say, you just say the, the perpetrator the police have the perpetrator in custody. That's it. And then to say the loser is caught, you know, whatever. But don't go on. I don't want to hear all the stories and all the fake reasons why he did it, you know. 
because he's a psychopath who wants his day in the sun. I don't, you know, a lot of times it has nothing to do with race. It doesn't have anything to do with politics. It just has to do with people in a fishbowl that you can kill and get your name in the paper. And, and, it's, and it's no longer news. It's advertising, Pat. It's advertising. I like the word advertising. That's brilliant. Actually brilliant. It Lila. is free yeah. advertising. Nationwide free advertising. Across the entire nation on every single network. Yes. Ugh. And you know, people sometimes say, well, uh, that's not really inspiring them. I'm like, do you know how much you pay for a Super Bowl ad? Why do you pay that much for a Super Bowl ad? You know why? Because it sells whatever they're selling. So if you're going to do that, you just gave free advertising to every, uh, to this guy everywhere. Massive free advertising. You sold the idea of mass murder, didn't you? To the next guy. And he goes, that is exactly what they're doing. And that's what I told Dennis. I said, don't watch those shows. It's free advertising. Don't watch the advertising. Wow. That's brilliant. I love that. I love the, uh, I, I don't think I've ever heard the term advertising in this sense before. And I, I think it's brilliant. Thank you, Lila. I mean, I think that's, I like it. I like that. Well, I'm, I'm glad I finally made a valid point. <laughs> no, no, no. Wait a minute. That's not true. <laughs> you make good points in the McCann case. You make good points about serial homicide and you make good points on this i think you're a winner all the way around you're not the loser (laughs) not at all not at all no you've you've brought up a lot of great points and and uh this was i this i think uh is my favorite but i i do think you know because i have a big thing about the issue of mass murder um but uh Let's see. Uh, I think it's the it's the media that's proliferating. These kids oh, wouldn't even have an idea if they didn't do all this shit. Yeah, and you know, it's not. It's uh, the thing. It's so sad is that you know a lot of people thought you know when I when I took my stand. Uh, there's other people. I'm not saying I'm the only person that's ever taken a stand on this. There's a there's a group called. Uh, uh, they were they they started out. Real, it was after the Colorado murder. They they got a little bit of a grip, right? And it was called. Uh, don't oh, wait a minute. Shoot, now see, I've even forgotten their names because I think they've somehow sort of disappeared a little bit. But it was like, don't say his name, don't use his name, don't say, don't show his face, don't use his name. They had a big thing on that. Uh, there was a police chief that got behind all that and said, I will no longer, when I do a press conference, I will no longer use the guy's name and show a picture of him. And so they were like so excited about that. And and I, I remember back then I promoted them. I think they might've promoted me because cause I was hoping that if we all promoted this, if we could advertise the right thing, the police chief, this organization, myself, and anybody else, that we shouldn't be doing this. We shouldn't be helping advertise this, right? The media should stand down. I thought we would get some, you know, traction. But you know, if I look up Colorado, I'm gonna look that up because I wonder how far, how long ago was the Colorado, um, that movie theater case? That's when this. That's when I took a stand, and that's when this group came out. Um, and so I'm thinking, how many years is that now? Okay, hold on a second. Colorado a long time. Theater, theater, theater. Twenty shooting, years. Shooting. Let's see if I can come up with it here. Oh come on. Oh, 2012 Aurora, Colorado shooting. Ten years ago. Ten years ago on July 20th. So it's almost exactly ten years. And guess what's happened in 10 years? Not much. Zero. Because I'm not allowed on TV. They won't, You know what's interesting? They won't even let me come on TV to talk about mass murder. I was just asked by uh, the Jim, uh, Jim Buchanan show. Um, uh, Pat, I'm sorry. Yeah, Jim Buchanan. Jim Bohannon, sorry. <laughs> Mixing shows. Jim, Jim Bohannon. Jim Bohannon show just asked me to come on uh, about the, the uh, one up north. The, the Buffalo one and I said I'll oh, come on but my segment must only be about mass murder in general what happens and the ma- and the media's role in proliferating mass murder that was the last I heard from them they're like oh thanks okay we'll get back to you <laughs> so they won't even let me on to talk about the media's role because they're the media and they don't want to be blamed and they want to continue what they're doing how do you stop the media from doing something that's bringing them mass money. How do you do that? Anybody got any ideas? 
<laughs> How do you stop well, someone them? could break protocol and refer to him at every turn as the loser. We're looking for the loser. They caught the loser. But they get that. But the but the money they're making, the views they get, is by is by putting the face and the, the name out and talking about the guy, showing the picture. They don't want to do the other stuff. That's the problem. It's the same reason I say with um a lot of the YouTube shows. What gets traction in YouTube shows? If you take like the uh, the Gabby Petito case. It's somebody who does a show on Gabby Petito every single day, picking out something from the case and getting people to be, get excited about it. If they don't do that, they're not going to get the views. So they do that because that's how you get a massive amount of subscribers and a massive amount of views. If you choose not to do that, you get to be an educational channel like me, <laughs> you know, because I don't want to do that. But so the media, the problem is the media runs on making a whole lot of money. And their whole thing is about every kind of good breaking news they can get. Anything, you know, the, what they say, if it bleeds, it sells, right? So, so much of our media is about murder. I mean, they love murder more than anything else in the world. The media loves murder. And all the, even if you take the, all the uh, shows on TV, right? Think about it. Oxygen, when, when, uh, um, that was started, right? The Oxygen Channel. What was the Oxygen Channel supposed to be? It was supposed to be Oprah's nice channel for positive things for women. Do you know what you know what they do now? Almost solid crime. They found out that I guess talking about making you no know, a nice quilt wasn't <laughs> and, and, and how to have be feel better about yourself. Maybe some nice meditation that didn't sell, but crime sold. So. That's the problem. Pat, can so, I say something here that's sure. interesting? Evil is very seductive. Yes. Now, when you advertise for a play, I'm sorry, when you um, when you audition for a play, uh, do you want to play the ingenue that gets married and has the wonderful kids and everything <laughs> goes wonderful? Or do you want to play the alcoholic who lost his last chance, goes out and kills someone, tries to cover it up, gets in all sorts of trouble? Mm. People always want to play the bad guy. Evil is very seductive. Wait, wait, wait. Lila, I have a question. Yeah. Are you a writer? <laughs> I have a friend who keeps trying to get me to write for the New York Times. Oh, and I keep saying, Tommy, I have no end to the New York Times. Thank no, you no, for the compliment. Skip the New York Times, but I have to say, you're very well spoken. You have a great command of language. You're very, very creative. You have... You, you, you express scenarios extremely well. You'd be, a, you know, you probably would be a very fine writer in writing about evil, just the way. <laughs> I'm very impressed. <laughs> I think you have a career. Well, thank you. <laughs> Being impressed by my take on evil. But don't you, don't you see? It's, it's one of those uh, yeah. conundrums in life. The evil is just, it is seductive to us. That but on the other true. hand, I think people would love to see a photo of that loser hooked to a plumbing pipe with a lone female guard beside him. I think that they would love. I think people in the living rooms would just love that. Uh, or do you think I'm wrong? Uh, no, I no, I think it would be really nice that I, I like I like the concept of every single guy they actually catch dead or alive. I don't care if he's dead. You still hang him on the pole. And because they do this in some countries, you know what I mean? They show you the dead guy yeah. and him outside for the reason that, oh, look at that loser. You know what I mean? Look at him now. Because unfortunately, when you're dead, you don't look great, you know? So, unless they and, dress and the you Becker up. says to control the photos. He said, right. we'll give you a photo, but you got to do this one. He talks about how to control the right. access to photos or the photos of me. Yeah, yeah, sure. Take a photo. Here you are next to the plumbing pipe, lone female, female guard. You right. don't march them out in public with the 20 right. vests on FBI yeah. agents, you know, bulletproof. Well, well, think of this too. You control the photos. If you, if you took a, if you had a collage of like eight different uh, mass murderers, right? And uh -huh. put their pictures like four here and four here, right? If you put, which is like some of these mass murder um, uh, sites on the internet, right? If they put the four people, they'll show the guy with a gun guy with a gun the guy with a gun right so they all look like army guys you know look at me i'm taking people out ah, you know they all look cool but if you took that pipe picture and you put loser pipe loser pipe loser on the pipe loser on the pipe all across then the budding mass murder would look at that and go dang i don't want to end up looking like that because look how all the mass murderers end up they have no get no respect that's the becker's point that's yeah that's great. his whole point oh mm -hmm. man i'm already a loser i don't need to be a, 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 a loser squared right right yeah 
I love that concept. I think that's brilliant, and I just wish, I wish that the media cared more about the lives of human beings, especially when, when it comes down to mass murder killing children. Um, you know, that that the media doesn't care about the children. I I I don't understand that. I mean, that's I think I think that's when I kind of realized the light bulb went on. I'm like, you know, aren't I? Aren't I an accessory to murder? You know, if if I they are this, I'm an accessory, and I, you know, when a child they are no, they're accessories murdered, to murder. It's my fault if I've encouraged that. Now with serial killers, it's a little different because, I mean, it's true that some of them get the thrill out of the book that's written. But here's a little difference about serial killers: they will do whatever they do regardless. Most of them do not want to get caught. They, they actually all of them don't want to get caught. They like the thrill of the kill, right? They're going to do that without the media has nothing to do with that they're going to do that on their own what we're lacking in serial homicide is good police investigative work to catch them before they can continue now, if we could catch them on the first time then we save 20 people's lives okay that is the important thing about serial homicide now the reason it looks like they could be interested in the media is because once they're caught and they they can't kill anymore they change their game to manipulating people in the media to manipulating a writer, to them bragging about their, their crimes in the media after the fact. So in that case, the media is not actually inspiring them to kill. They're just available once the, the show that show is done. Uh, so for that reason, I think we need to understand more how they work so that people can recognize them. And because like take a, take a case like Delphi. The problem is, I don't know, the police may be onto something we are not aware of, uh, but the problem is when you have a serial homicide, you often see the years go by because they, the right person isn't identified. And, and it didn't, they don't identify him quickly enough to get to his house and find the evidence. So that's a problem with serial homicide. So if we could get, if we could get better police investigation and better tips, we might be able to let, you know, uh, help reduce serial homicide. So that's the key to that, and the books are kind of on the periphery, um, and the and the shows. So even, but those kind of help us understand them, which helps. With mass murderers, that does no good at all. What mass murderers need is to know that a, if they go into a place, they're going to be shot down before they can do anything. That would be one method. You know, you're not going to get away with it. And two, if you get away with it, you're just going to be presented as a freaking loser, and you're not going to get any immediate attention. That would then cut down on uh, mass murder. But we aren't doing the things that work on either side of it. Serial homicide investigation is still in the dark ages, in my opinion. And, and mass murder, the media won't let go of. So how do, we, how do we fix these areas so that we can save people's lives, you know? And I, I'm at a loss on that one. <laughs> you know, at a loss. At Lisa said something interesting. What did she say here? Wait a minute. Um, uh, oh, Lisa escaped work again. In, in New Zealand, we tried to address this with our Christ Church mass murderer. Our PM refused to say his name to minimize publicity. Oh, that's good. Okay. His name wasn't secret, but no one remembers it because lots of the press followed the lead of our, our prime minister and didn't talk about it much. At least that's my recollection. That would be cool if that is true. I, I like that. Um, and I... I I agree that uh, the other Lisa says, uh, very progressive of your prime minister. That, that's, that's absolutely awesome. Um, yeah, uh, well, I don't know why in the US, uh, we're, we're, we're pretty pitiful, you know, we are, and it's embarrassing. And, and I say, I've tried to, I tried to have an effect and I, I'm just one person. I haven't been very successful, <laughs> you know, unfortunately, you know, um, but I wish, I wish people like, um, Gavin De Becker is far more well known than I, um, and so is Park Dietz. Uh, I wish they would get together and maybe have a big push. I don't know how they would do it, but you know, I'd be all for that um, if they could do it. You know. Well, Pat, can I interject something here? Sure. As far as you not being as famous, I've been and I may be imagining things, but I've been looking at your channel, and it looked at one point it was growing by fifty a day. Now it looks like it's growing by two hundred a day. I think it will snowball, and you'll be up there with these other people at six million followers. Uh, probably not. Um, I'm an educational channel, and I will not do the thing. See, I don't do the things where I do the same. Sh I didn't do like 
Gabby Petito every day for the entire thing. I'm not doing, I, the reason I gained a few extra people was because I kind of did those two jokes on Amber, Amber Heard. Okay, that's, that's really the reality of it. I, all of a sudden, somebody put my Amber Heard, they did my little clip, and I put Am, my Amber Heard thing on Twitter, and then it went over to TikTok, and then it went, then it went over to, um, some guy then took it and put it on YouTube. He's got like half a million views, and I, I put the same clip up, and I've got uh-huh. like a, a thousand. <laughs> so he's got half a million views on my video. Okay. But anyway, uh, I didn't stop him. I'm like, I'm not going to worry about him stealing it. I don't know. But anyway, the problem there is that Amber Heard, if people, some people saw my Amber Heard thing and then subscribed. They're subscribing only because they're hoping I will do something on Amber Heard every day for the next two months. Because So I'll milk Amber Heard. But I'm not here to talk about Amber Heard in general. I'm not. I mean, I'm, I'm a criminal profiler. I don't have any reason to talk more about Amber Heard. Um, or the trial. I just did the two things because A, I met Amber Heard. So I couldn't resist saying something because I have met Amber Heard and I was in that green room with her years ago uh, with Johnny, you know, before she met Johnny Depp and I couldn't stand her. I was like, oh my God, you know, this woman is horrible. And I still remember that all these years later because it was such a torturous time I spent in that room with her. So it's only because I know that, you know. And then I did that one little thing on the trial, just made a little joke thing. So, yes, occasionally I do something that is popular. Like Delphi is very popular. And, and, and when the, the recent one came out on the search warrant, I wanted to speak on that because people were misunderstanding the meaning and the importance of the search warrant. So I will then speak out on that. But I'm not going to do something on Delphi every single day. So the answer to that is no, I will never have a million subscribers I won't um, because, because I that's not my kind of channel that's not what I'm trying to do and what I have here more depth of understanding as opposed to gossip you know gossip and all you know that kind of armchair profiling you know that's that's what do you see in the camera over there oh my god I saw an arm so it must be you know <laughs> so no and, and, and I accept that and that's the way it's going to be but the problem is when you want to get something done like mass murder you need somebody in a position like Gavin De Becker. Gavin De Becker is, I'm an independent criminal profiler. I've never been an FBI profiler. I'm kind of the renegade. Um, and when you want to change certain policies, when you want to make a difference in these certain levels, you have to be in that level. So Park Dietz would have much more impact if he says that than me, and so would Gavin De Becker. So, you know, I'm all for whoever has the ability who's in these levels run with it. I mean, I don't need the credit for it. You run with it and, and see it because I want people's lives saved, you know, and I don't care who succeeds in, you know, achieving, getting rid of the advertising. Like you say, if they can do it. Yeah. I don't care who does it. Just do it. You know, I don't, I, you know, I'm not connected to, you know, uh, the process I'm connected to the result. <laughs> so, but I love the advertising point and I don't think I've heard that. Now, did, is that the exact word he used? Was advertising or was that you, Lila, who said that? Uh, that's my word. That's your word. Okay, then. I think you've just contributed to the field of... Uh, I, I, I didn't hear anybody else using the term advertising. Um, I've, used the, I've used the advertising term in, 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 in violent uh, video games because a lot of people who say that violent video games do not affect our children. And I'm like... Nonsense. But I'm like, so again, if, if you... If you pay a million dollars for an ad on Super Bowl, when a child does a video game, that's an advertisement every time he plays it. And you don't think that's going to have an effect on his brain? The way he thinks about things? Of course it will. So I've used the term advertisement for video games, violent video games, but I've never actually used it. I've used like, giving the media giving the, um, giving the um, perpetrator infamy. That's usually what I say it. When they give all, when they do all these shows, they give infamy to the, to the killer. He gets all that attention. It's, it's worse but than I like advertising. The advertising. It's word free better. advertising. It's free. free. That's what makes it just insidious. Uh, and I think you're correct. I think that is absolutely the per- perfect way to put it. And you know what happens because they're advertising it? What do you make? What do, What does a media channel make from advertising? More than I do. Money. <laughs> Money. Exactly. But when you get advertising, you make money. So by advertising mass murder the way they do in the mass murderer, they're making money off of this. So they're making money on the blood of murdered children in the they school are. In, in Texas. So yeah. I, I think the big deep problem here is human nature. It's it's greed. 
uh, human yeah. greed uh. because they want the money. You do something that's fulfilling. You feel good. You do good for people. You right. bring out educational points. I would think that working as a news anchor these days many times, like with these uh, mass murders, must you must go home feeling very empty. You know, it, you're not doing good for society. You wonder, you wonder about that. There, there's, a, there's the, the adrenaline rush that comes with working in the television industry, and the mass ego that one gets working in the television industry is, is, is pretty. It's pretty strong because it's a world which is a world that most, no, most, most Americans and most people across the world never have an opportunity to be on television, right? Um, and that's why that's why people will do whatever they can to be on reality shows and even if it looks humiliating they'll still do it because they want to be on television right but so for people who are actually working in the media in television on a regular basis it becomes a bit like a drug it's an adrenaline rush the the the, the uh, industry is very fast moving and when they would, they would call me i was i did i've done over three thousand television appearances in uh, news appearances and nancy grace and today's show and all those things and they call you and you're like, Pat, we really want you on today, you know? And then the limo comes and takes you there and you run in, you get your hair done, makeup, and you get in there. Hey, Pat, we're doing here with Pat Brown, blah, 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 blah. You know, it's hard to say that doesn't have an effect on you feeling good about yourself, you know what I mean? And enjoying the thrill because it's very fast moving. It's very energetic. I say it's, it's, it's like everything, everything's buzzing. So that's what the host of the shows do. First of all, the host of all these shows make a crap load of money, okay? Uh, people who are people who work on the shows like me don't make much money, if any. Okay, a lot of people do sh do a lot of television for free, but like Nancy Grace made a lot of money, but the people on the shows they don't pay. I only made my money, and I, most people know this by now. My my story, I didn't make money. Nancy Grace, I, they still owe me two thousand dollars, by the way. <clears throat> oh, no. Yeah, they do. They they stiffed me out of two thousand dollars. Jeez. Yeah. So what happened is. I worked. I start. I, I did. I did uh, CNN. I did CNN lineups. I would do come in, do the six o'clock show, seven o'clock show. Jane Velez Mitchell, Nancy Grace, Joe Behar, you know, uh, Doctor Drew. I do the whole lineup, right? One show after the other, four shows in a row. And then I come in during the day and do CNN again. And and meanwhile, I do Fox and MSNBC and everybody else. And but I did Nancy Grace at least three times a week. Um, and so I was a regular on a show forever. They never paid me. They don't pay people. They call us guests. They don't call. We're actually news commentators, but they call us guests. And you can work up to 40 hours a week and never get a paycheck. That's the truth. And the only reason I got out of that, and the only reason I was one of the few people who got paid, was because I, I refused the limo service. And I said, your limo service never gets here on time. I will only use the always available transport service um, because they get me there. And they're $80 an hour, two-hour minimum. That they're, they're cheaper than what you're using. And they all, every one of the networks agreed. And so I drove myself to work, and I got paid eighty dollars from the time I left my house, <laughs> eighty dollars an hour, <laughs> you know. And that's and so from that moment on, when I went to do Nancy Grace, I got paid. When I did the whole lineup, I got paid. I got paid for every show I ever did. But they only were paying for the car; they weren't paying for me. But I was the driver of the car, so I got paid. I I did that for ten years. They never knew. They never figured it out. And I never lied to them. I said I use always available transport service. I didn't call it a limo. I was transporting myself to the work. I was transporting transporting myself back home. You know? And they would sometimes ask, can your driver stay longer? And I go, sure. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so that's how I got paid. And one finally when I finished ended ended working with them. They found that out and they just said, oh my God, that's brilliant. You're the only person who's ever done that. That was brilliant because you got paid. I'm like, you think I, I'm not stupid. I'm not gonna work for you for 10 years for no money. Because you know, people do it for publicity because they wanna be on TV, right? I said, I'm not doing it for no money. I mean, I have to, I have to eat. I, I, and, I, and I also feel like I should be paid, but that's the way the networks work. They don't wanna pay you. So yeah, so it's a lot of, it's a lot of the TV industry is very interesting, but it, it, the hosts of the show make a lot of money. I mean, we're talking up to, you know, maybe a million dollars, maybe two million. You think they're going to give that up? You think they're going to say, I'm going to take a stand? They're going to be off television and they may be booted. They may be blacklisted out of television. So they not only lose maybe a million dollars a year or more and more and more, or, and they don't get the thrill of being the host of the show anymore. Now they're not the big anchor anymore. They're not they don't have their own show because they took a stand. So now that now they're going to go work down the block at the pizza place, you know, 
What? So they go along with the program. They they squash the feelings of anything is wrong. Every, this is what we do in television. And Jim Bohannon, Jim Bohannon's show when they asked me on, they had a guest host because I'm like really surprised because Jim Bohannon, we got along great until the day I said the mass, me the mass media was highly responsible for the increase in mass murder. He got very angry on the show and I, he never let me on a show again. And we, I've been on a show. I was, he, was, he really liked me. He had me on a show all the time. I'd go into a studio and sit there with him. The minute I criticized the mass media, he got, he got livid and never let me back on. You see? So it's very hard to deal with uh, the media and giving up, um, giving up for them what is mass murder is, ooh, you know, that's the way they make a lot of money. It's really well, yeah, sad. There's isn't two it? things here. It just, it, no matter how much it strokes their ego, this isn't fulfilling. If they're doing it like that, the sense of fulfillment, the sense of ego may be good, but there's no fulfillment here. Second thing is, I was thinking, there needs to be, you know how you have to get a, a card to get into SAG or AFTRA? Right. If there were a way to somehow get a union of uh, consultants, what did they call you? You're a, uh, there's a term that they call you, an advisor, what was that term? For what? Commentator? What you did. Uh, uh, for what you did. You come on the show and yeah, you're a consultant. Was actually, they call us a guest. Commentator? Anyway. Yeah, we're really, I was really a news commentator. Uh, can't they? Can't they? Can't the news? Can't people in your ilk get together and somehow? <laughs> is there a way to get a union like SAG or AFTRA for the commentators that would just no. like you must pay a person well, so much money if they speak a line? Can't they do something so they must be paid so much money to appear on the big, show? It's a huge system. It's hard to fight. I don't know how they got the other system going, but let, you know, I can tell you. Sometimes getting into SAG means you have to sleep with people too. That's how you get into oh, great. SAG. Yeah, it's a casting. Great. Couch. So that's not even clear that way. So, no. So what happens? They bring, they right before I started working in the news, they used to pay us, and I heard they paid really well. So you know, it was really frustrating because right when I came in, they had stopped paying. And if they hadn't done that, I would have had a nice salary every year, felt comfortable, I could go to work. But at, right when they figured out, we'll call them guests and we'll say we don't pay them. And here's what the here's the joke of it all. We don't pay our guests because we don't want to influence what they say. And yet, you, you give your pre-interview, and if you don't say what they like, they won't have you on. They lie. They totally lie about that. That's just, that's just uh, it's all phony. Um, so the guests, the guests, they basically, they control the guests. And if you want to come on my show, and you want to get, you know, the publicity, you know, maybe Pat, criminal profile, Pat Brown, author of whatever book I've written, you know, if I want that on the screen, I get publicity. That's my payment. Uh, you know, it's amazing. And so people, people essentially work for free. It's a slave system. It's almost a plantation system. You want to call that? You know, it's that's a TV exactly plantation. what I was going to say. It's yeah. like it, it is. It's like a plantation yeah. system. Slave you have, literal you have slave, the slave labor. masters on top. Then you have the the what, what do you call the guys that run the field? Um, the uh, who's that guy? The slave masters would be the 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 the. the, the the people at the top of the, you know, who run the network. Overseers. The overseers. overseers right? So all the hosts are like overseers. And then you've got all the slaves. And that would be a, either the interns that are underpaid or all the f guests that work for free. They're total slaves. Yeah. That's the way it works. People have no idea. They all, I don't know how many people, when I was on television, thought I was like rich as crap. But I'm like, I'm not rich. <laughs> this doesn't pay that well. Only because of my all this available transport service. Do I get a paycheck so I can eat and so I can continue with my work? Because I want my pro profiling work has never paid. You know, don't 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 imagine that it does. Um, I did a tremendous amount of pro bono work in my lifetime, um, and most FBI profilers once they leave the the force, they, they do consulting sometimes, but it's so occasional, it's so rare. Um, they're not, they're usually living on pensions. You know, uh, other profilers who profile things will either work for defense attorneys because all the money's in defense. So you'll see them, them get, you know, but they're, they're hired guns. That, that's where you make your money. Or you're a professor at a college and that's your basic support. And then you can do profiling on the side for free. So there's not big money in profiling, you know. So uh, you either, you know, I, I always did it because I, I love crime scene analysis and I want to change the methodology in the fields. But, you know, and luckily I'm not, 
I'm not a big money hog. I don't, you know, I live very simply. So that helps. <laughs> that helps. Otherwise, it would bother me, and I would say, well, you know, I can't keep doing this because, you know, I'm not making decent decent money. But they should pay. People who work should be paid. And the fact that it's 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 not illegal to have people work 40 hours a week for the network and not get paid is amazing, isn't it? <laughs> it's pitiful. It's pitiful. Yeah, and they're experts in their field. That's what's really amazing. It's not even like I'm a teenager who's never worked before and I'm going to be an intern. I mean, they're hiring me as an expert. And, you know, so it, it's it's phenomenal. And the same thing even is true of documentary work. Um, I do get paid for my documentary work, but I have to fight for it. And a lot of times they dump me because they can find somebody for free. Or they'll say, uh, you know, we'll, we'll pay for your flight and your hotel. And I'm like, you know, I... I'm an expert in the field. You want my expertise, and all I get out of it is a is a torturous plane flight and a crappy hotel. You know? And I, st- you know, oh, we'll give you oh a per diem, fifty bucks. Thanks a lot. You know, <laughs> it's greed and it's pitiful. It is, and they're making and, and a lot of money. Inexcusable. That's the thing. The documentary people are making money, so it's it, like it's hard to understand. It's hard to understand. Why can't they share some of it? Why can't they be equitable? Uh, because people aren't. If they can get away with it, they won't do it. And if they can it's find just, somebody greed, to fill Pat. in. It's just greed. Yeah, greed. greed. I think you're right. Greed is, is one of the, you know, it's a, one of those uh, sins, Seven deadlies. You know? Mm-hmm. And it's unfortunately, and it, you're right. In the long run, from working in the field, I found a lot of very sad people. They're not, they aren't happy people. They're, they're, cha- they're chasing their ego, trying to keep their egos up. They're chasing one more thing that makes them happy. And, and it's a very, I've, I've seen a lot of people with a lot of emotional problems, you know, who under these circumstances, because, yeah, it's not really healthy. Let me put it that way. <laughs> you know, it isn't. Um, but that, unfortunately, I, I would like to find a way to solve that so that we get, we could v- get the news back to being real journalism, which it isn't anymore. The journalism's gone. Um, and, and have ethics returned to the field. So that the pride would be in good journalism and good ethics, and and um, but we need that in our school system, you know. We need that in so many places, and we're we're suffering across the board. I think in the humanity, on the ethics and we are decency, we definitely but, are. And it's 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 just, it's, just a, it's rough sometimes. Um, Oh, let me let me answer this question. I think it's uh, oh, it's time to go to bed. <laughs> it's like eleven thirty now. <laughs> it's been so much fun. I forget to. It's like <laughs> uh, Lisa says, Pat, do you know any other independent criminal profiles other than yourself? Yes, um, there's very few of us. Uh, Brent Turvey is probably the most other well-known one. Um, does now a lot of defense work. Uh, that's and he's got he's got he's orga- organized a group which they works with a bunch of other people who there's a couple other independent profiles with him and forensic people. Um, uh, it's, 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 um, I think he works out of a lot of out of Mexico now. Um, I, 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 I'm going to be using his books and, and some of his stuff in my, uh, in my profiling teaching stuff. Um, Brent Turvey and I are, are not, are not on good, good terms. Um, he doesn't particularly go for me. Um, <laughs> a lot of egos in the field, uh, and unfortunately, um, and, uh, he has some objections to my, my existence but um but he does do some good stuff so you know uh everybody contributes in some way um i like to think of it that way uh but yeah very few independent criminal profiles because the fbi has had a a a a, a steel grasp on that on the field for so long as if only people can be a profiler are those who are in the fbi and it's prevented a lot of what should be ability to go to school and study criminal profiling, crime scene analysis, and then work with police departments across the nation. I would like to see a th- thousands of criminal profilers and crime scene analysis working with major police departments and on loan to smaller police departments. That would be a dream for me. I'd love to see that. Um, I mean, I, d- I think it's ridiculous to think there can only be a few criminal profilers in the world as if we have some like incredible, miraculous brain that no one else can replicate. <laughs> You know, stupid. You know, I mean, you can teach if you can teach doctors to be doctors, you can teach lawyers to be lawyers. Why can't you teach profilers to be profilers? You know, it should be the same thing. It should be a technique. Uh, uh, Pat, I'll tell you why. Because most people don't got no common sense, and you can't teach common sense. <laughs> well, it, it logic. It is an issue. Logic is a big issue in the in the criminal profiling field. 
Um, but I do, I, I think it's true. You have to have a certain nature. It's kind of like anything else though. Um, you can't be a musician if you don't have some talent. You know what I'm saying? You can't be an artist if you don't have creativity. Uh, if you have no command of the language, you're not going to be a good writer. So I think that's true in any field. So with, with criminal profiling, the people that should go into criminal profiling, crime scene analysis, should be people who generally have good logic skills. And then from there, they can be taught how to apply those logic skills to crime scenes and, 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 and evidence and to figure, think, figure things out, how thing, you know, what, what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. So I think that can be taught. I think you do have to have the basics. I mean, they just do. I mean, like um, there's things that, there's fields I know I can't go into because I don't have the qualities for that field. You know, I don't. So it's like, <laughs> like that's just not happening. You know, um, I, I talk about cleaning a lot because I've had some people say to me, well, you know, if you wanted to clean your house, you could. <laughs> In my entire life, I've hated cleaning. It's not because I think I'm above cleaning. It's not that. I like doing the dishes. I don't own a dishwasher, never owned a dishwasher. I like the process of washing dishes. And I think the dishwasher is annoying to me. It gets in the way, it's loud, it's a pain in the ass, you gotta put it stuff in, then you gotta take it back out. I think it's stupid. So anyway, I just stand in front of my pretty window, look out at the flowers, and I wash. And I, I could be a dishwasher. But tell me to clean the bathroom? <laughs> I can't scrub. I've tried to scrub. I don't seem to have the skills to understand how to do it, the nature for it. So I hire people. I'm like, let me go to work, make money over here, and I'll hand this to you. And you do what you're good at. And I'm watching the ladies clean my house, and I'm astounded. It's amazing what they do. And I'm like, I come in, and I'm like, oh, my God, they clean my refrigerator. <laughs> They're so excited, you know. And they, they also do little towel animals and stuff. So they, they, like things, they set my little stuffed animals on my bed you know it's like like so cute but they have a nature for it and I, I I think they have a because they have a nature for doing it then they're able to use learn the skills of cleaning and add that to the nature so why can't we as you know in a profiling world same thing you have to have the basic nature and then you can learn the skills why not um uh, let's see what uh Liz, Lisa says in Turvey's books he makes a list of not only qualifications, but characteristics which make a good criminal profiler in terms of personality. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just have to laugh because he thinks I'm not qualified. <laughs> it's, it's a lot. Turvey and I have been at this for like 20 years. I wish, I wish, I wish we could just come to a truce on it. You know, I really do. He came after me very. He he, he kind of came after me in, in the public and the paper, uh, newspapers and stuff. And so I was, and saying I was just, uh, I was in comp, I was a crazy woman essentially. So, so I wonder what his personality thing is. <laughs> I'll have to look back at that, but no, his, Brent Turvey writes really good books. He's an excellent author um, and he breaks things down into very, very uh, clear as far as understanding patterns of how to do things. Um, he's very good at that. So I, I particularly like his criminal profiling book, and that will be that's my number one thing I always used in teaching. And he's got a, he's got a number of other books he's written with some other people like Wayne Petherick, and and they're very good. So I I totally approve of his books. I think they're very good. Um, so you know, I I always say don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, it's like. You don't, you know, people don't, people could say, oh, I think Pat Brown's really correct about that case, but I, I don't like her. <laughs> I'm okay with that. Or uh, Pat Brown's great about these cases, but she sucks on that one. Okay. You know, and then give your reasoning, uh, you know, give your explanation so that people can, can judge, you know, uh, maybe I am off on that case and, and, and I need to find out that I am and maybe somebody did it better. And so that's, that's useful. Um, yeah, he's entitled to his opinion. Yes, he is but I think your record and career speak for themselves, eh, you know, <laughs> and, and his speak for him. You know, I'm entitled to my opinion. Same thing. He can say, you know, but I've done, but I do, but I do what I do. And he's right. So, yeah. Uh, so I think we, the pro, one of the biggest problems in the reason the ego is there. And the reason I think that Brent Turvey had issues with it. That's just my opinion is that he was one of the original independent criminal profilers and he was a little protective of his field. And I actually took some of his classes way back in the early 90s. And I think he thought of me as a student. And then I went on and had my own business. And then he got, a, he got really ticked about that. And I think it's because I didn't get a stamp of approval uh, to do the work. And then I was successful. And I think he didn't take well to that. But this is the point. 
every, everybody can contribute to the field in different ways. Um, not just, you know, I contribute in my way. He contributes in his way. Uh, Cheryl McCollum, she does, a, she does a lot of stuff. She used to be on Nancy Grace with me. Um, she just still does stuff at Nancy Grace at Crime Con, and she does stuff down in Atlanta. Um, and she, she does a whole different kind of thing than me. She's very different from me, but she contributes to the field in just a very different way. And that's fine, because we don't just want one criminal profiler running around. Why do we have to have just one? Why can't we have hundreds of criminal profilers because we go to tv don't you see hundreds of lawyers on tv talking don't you see doctors talking why is it there's only there's only supposed to be like two and two profilers in the world you know john douglas and you know he's the one that everybody always thinks of as john douglas it's like there's other people out there who can do the job and we should be able to train people and i did have my course i uh, excelsior college i developed the five five course program for a cert certificate in criminal profiling and then they screwed my program over but that was my idea it was my first place where I started teaching and I wanted other people to learn the skills because I don't want to be the only criminal profiler running around it's stupid you know <laughs> so but um and I, right here we see people who are here in the chat room and Lila that you're here you have some very I think you have some really good logical stuff in there and some very interesting well, I opinions I have another idea. I, yeah. The reason that there's not more criminal profilers is they do not offer it as a as a major study at universities. Why don't you write a proposal to John Jay College of Natural no, no. Law <laughs> for a curriculum in cr uh, criminal profiling, and you would conduct it? Then you could make money. And no, get you didn't hear what I no? just said. Okay. Oh, I actually went no, to John. Sorry. Jay. I went to John. I Jay. know. Yes, I did. I went to all. I went there in person. I, know. I I actually was in a room with with all the people. I presented my course, and there's a particular woman who is prominent up there, and she acts, she nixed it. She went, get her out. No, you're kidding me. No. And then I, I think went of to, all the money they could take. Everyone's that, interested in this field. Well, path. what happened If they was, taught it, they'd have a lot of money. Well, that happened. People would want well, to take I can it. tell you what happened, Lila. See, this is the academic field is rife with a lot of competition and issues. So she is a, um, I'm not going to say I'm blank on the name. Uh, she is, oh, darn it, um, she, comes, she comes from a different version of methodology for profiling, okay? Uh, comes out of England. Uh, uh, and so that particular method, oh, Maurice Godwin also is part of that particular, what do you call a, just a, a wing of profiling. And so I wanted, to, I wanted to offer something different. She's very academic very much into research and statistics, okay? I wanted to put in a very uh, applicable type of thing, very logical, down to earth, applicable. And she's from the other side of thinking. So they, she was like, no, this isn't academic enough. So I went to Excelsior College and I developed a program for them. I, I spent a, I, it was, I did um, 16, I think there were 16 week courses, five 16 week courses in forensic pathology, criminal profiling, crime scene analysis, serial, 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 uh, serial crime, and the other one, um, uh, oh, psychopathology. I developed all of that. I, I taught it, and then they booted me out of the college because I wouldn't grade and flight and, and let people plagiarize. And then they, they wanted me to make it so easy so they wouldn't have to do any work. And then they watered the program down, and now it's gone. I, I was very upset about that because I worked so hard and for very peanuts, uh, peanuts. But that was going to be the first time first it was the first criminal profiling program in the united states it's also now the only not there's now no criminal profiling program because mine's gone and i haven't seen it anymore, very so. sad i Is bet that universities could make a lot of money on it they could i don't know what people the are problem tremendously is. interested in this yeah. field i've i i i've you know i fought with that for years and i couldn't believe it but see see we have we have i don't know i don't know why they won't do it uh, because there's not a lot of work in the field, so like you, know, you, you graduate and you can't work for anybody. Where are you going to work? <laughs> you know, because the Good police point. departments won't let you work with them, and they're not they're not into hiring criminal profilers. So the FBI is the only place that theoretically has any. So you know you could you're, where are they going to work? So I don't know. So I think there's a problem with that um, employment issues. Uh, it's, there, I hope that sometime in my lifetime I can solve some of those problems, but <laughs> you know, I'm running out. You know, I'm getting a little older. <laughs> I may have to live to 120. Uh, so, uh, 
that is okay there's a certificate program at new haven university here in, in connecticut um a certificate program in forensics am i correct not in criminal profiling is that correct lisa i would think it's a forensics because that's where uh brent brent turvey came out of new haven so i think that's forensics he's a friend he's really a forensics uh what does he even call himself i'm not sure um it's a forensics and so there's some things there the problem is there's not a comprehensive program which is what i developed because my opinion is there's programs on psychology there's programs on forensics or even forensic pathology and there's there's programs on criminal justice but none of them are actually what you need for criminal profiling which is aspects of each one of those put together and so that's what i finally did that's what i put together for excelsior college and it just vanished all that work and i have the program it's an i have the entire program here but they bought it so i can't, I can't even use the program i made so very sad very it sad <laughs> it really sucks i mean there's you know there's these life is like this you know so many disappointments you keep working at things to try to make a difference to improve things and just a lot of disappointments and you just kind of go let me suck that one up and keep going you know so you know I have things I can still do in the field, and that's what I keep I keep chipping away at, you know, uh, so that I can feel like I've contributed to the field. And hopefully, someday I may not be around to see it, but someday somebody will go. Well, I'm glad Pat Brown introduced that because now we have improved something. <laughs> so, and I hope other people do as well. I mean, it, it takes a collective of people to make changes in a, an entire field, and we need to do that with criminal profiling because it's the FBI kind of rail, you know, railroaded it and also sent it in a terrible direction, which, um, but they've got all the media, so everybody still thinks it's, it's, you know, successful, but it's not. And it's not that I have anything per personally against the FBI or their people. It's just, I think, inductive profiling, which is what they do, it just doesn't work, you know, and it never has. And, you know, so, you know, sometimes you just got to admit where, you know, if something doesn't work, it doesn't work, you know, and they, and they, but they have such good media, they never have to prove it, to, you know, that it did work. So anyway, that's just, you know, that's that. So anyway, I, I think I'm going to head to my bed because uh, it's uh, 1142 over here and uh, I have to get up in the morning. But Lila, you have been an absolutely wonderful guest. You've been absolutely well, fantastic. So everybody's going to enjoy this so much because when I put these I up, so people love listening to the guests that I have so um, it, it's I think they're really going to appreciate what our co-conversation and what you've had to offer so I'm going to I'm going to hopefully have you back uh, well you know well, I'll definitely have you back at another time I'm sure you're going to have other things you could talk about so other great offerings for for a show and uh, I, I'm really very happy with the show it's cool <laughs> well thank you pat it was a it was a pleasure and a privilege well to speak thank you with and everyone. so anybody who's speak watching this show if you want to come on the show like lila did and and have great things to say you can join patreon and uh and and uh join the show and uh also just like this like this and uh subscribe to the channel i think i forgot to even say that at the beginning of the show so screwed that up but uh if you're still here at the end of the show Please like this and subscribe to the channel and keep it going. So, um, oh, that was so nice of you, Lisa. And you have to have you. I have to have you back on too, Lisa. Pat and Lila, thank you much, so much for a great show. Oh, thank you so much. So that's off. Oh, that's that's very nice, of Lisa. And nice to see Pat's subscribers grow for whatever the reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is helpful because the algorithm does pay attention to that, and so the advertising is getting a little bit better. So that therefore I can. I can earn enough of a, um, a living with with what I'm doing at some point to uh, be able to do this as my exclusive thing, so that I can keep offering, offering everything I can offer and keep keep improving things. So, uh, but again, Lila, thank you for calling in. It's grand, and I do want you to come back. Okay. Will you thank do you. <laughs> it was a privilege, and I enjoyed it. Thank, thank you for you, listening Lila. to me. Okay. Hopefully, hopefully, I'll see you soon on the next uh, whatever chat room. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye.